from the high desert and the great American Southwest. I bid you all good evening and good morning from the Hawaiian Tahitian Island chains, eastward over flyover country to the Caribbean and the U.S. Virgin Islands, south into South America, north to the pole, and worldwide on the Internet. This is Ghost to Ghost AM. <laughs> this morning, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do something just a little bit different. Ghost stories, real ones, from all of you, all night long. I've been doing this on uh, this program, if I can remember to call it the right name, Ghost to Ghost AM. I've been doing this for uh, years and years and years at Halloween. Now, on the West Coast, or Hawaii, you're probably saying this is not yet Halloween. Points eastward are well aware it is now Halloween. The bulk of the program, in whatever time zone you reside, save perhaps Hawaii, will be on Halloween. Now, when I do a ghost show, I do a serious ghost show. That's all we talk about. That's all we do is tell ghost stories. Real ghost stories, because ghosts are real. That is my attitude about it. It has been for years. I've heard too many stories to believe otherwise. What creates a ghost? What is a ghost? I don't know. I just know that there really is something out there. And so, as a traditional item on this day of the year, we do nothing but tell ghost stories. And uh, if this is you. We could have a guest. Uh, there are many, many experts out there, people who would like to come on on Halloween. But I don't do that. I restrict it to all of you. And uh, I hope you will respect the fact that what we're looking for are serious and real stories of ghosts. Now, there certainly is something out there. I don't know what creates them. It seems as though... As though um, unsuspected or surprising uh, quick death will cause somebody to stay on. It seems as though unrequited love uh, causes somebody to stay on. And then there are literally myths that seem to continue. And tonight, during the night, we will talk about all of those and more. So, Ghost to Ghost coming up tonight. Happy Halloween. All right. Back in 1989, my husband and I moved into an old house built back in the 1880s here in Ashland, Oregon. The house had been a rental for many years prior to moving in. The landlord never mentioned anything strange occurring. Shortly after we moved in, our daughter was born. She was very ill, was hospitalized for a couple of months. When we finally brought her home, she needed oxygen support, plus the assistance of a heart monitor. As her bedroom was small, we moved her crib into the living room in order to accommodate the medical equipment. Every night I slept on the sofa next to her crib to keep a close eye on her. One winter night, at about one in the morning, I woke up, as I usually did at that particular time, to check on her. As I was sitting up, the rocking chair next to my daughter's crib began to rock back and forth by itself. My terror and shock was further intensified when the chair continued to rock faster and faster. It was almost as if whoever or whatever sitting in the chair was enjoying rocking. Although paralyzed with fright, I was able to yank the covers back over my face. That's what I do. Of course, hoping that when I looked again, the whole thing would be, you know, just a dream. After about five minutes, it seemed more like an eternity. I peeked out from under the covers, only to find the chair still rocking by itself. Needless to say, I was so frightened, I kept the covers over my head for the remainder of the night. Fortunately, my daughter never did wake up. She slept through the entire episode. Since that night, other explained things began to manifest. After coming home from a weekend trip, 
My husband and I found our daughter's framed baby pictures standing straight up on their sides, placed on the very edge of the shelf above the fireplace. If the pictures had been moved forward even an eighth of an inch more, they would have toppled. One afternoon, I was sitting at the kitchen table paying some bills. All of a sudden, my daughter's baby monitor began to pick up strange rustling noises coming from the room where she was taking a nap. The noises sounded as though someone or something was wearing heavy clothing that moved or shifted when they walked. When I went to check on her, I found her sound asleep in the exact position she'd been in when I put her down for a nap. Nothing in my daughter's room could logically explain the odd noise. Since this was the middle of the summer, we had our windows shut, the air conditioner on, all day long. My daughter did not have any blankets on her either. When I went back to the kitchen, the monitor began to pick up the same peculiar sounds. Other times, mainly in the evening, my husband and I would see a white mist or a cloud float across the ceiling in the living room above the fireplace. On several occasions, late in the evening, my husband and I would hear the voices of two elderly women talking. The voices came from the bathroom. Every time my husband got up to investigate, the voices ceased immediately. To make a long story short, we decided we didn't want to raise our child in this already occupied house. On the very last day we were there, a strong, almost sickening sweet aroma encompassed the area on both sides of the front door. As the day progressed, the smell became stronger, almost to the point that it was nauseating. Interestingly, the current residents have not reported anything unusual, and fortunately, our unwanted house guest did, didn't seem to follow us to our new home. Sincerely, Sherry in Ashland, Oregon. The above story is true, and she supplies... Her phone number. That's a haunted house. So, there are people that are haunted. There are people who see ghosts. There are ghosts that occupy houses and places of business because they are real. I think a lot of people don't want to believe it, but they are real. Here's another one for you, Art. In 1963, I bought a painting in an antique store of an 18th century lady. The painting has hung in my living room ever since. But when events do demand, she takes an active role. That's right, an active role. In 1970, when my youngest daughter was a few months old, we moved into Army quarters at Fort Bragg, just a few doors from... Uh, Dr. McDonald's, a few days after the murders. At night, I always shut Peggy's door, turned out her light. Every morning, I found the light on, the door back open, the painting askew on the wall, as if she was protecting the baby. Before my father died, my mother went into the living room and looked at Henrietta, as we call her, and came out saying the painting's eyes were so sad she couldn't stay in the same room. Before my mother died, Henrietta developed a slight crack in her face, just below one eye, like she had been crying. And I could really go on and on and on. I've been sent uh, many of them. Here, I'll do one more. Hey, Art, here is a true story about my cousin and her son. At the time, my cousin's bedroom was upstairs while the son's was in the basement. One night, the son was having a dream during which he walked upstairs, entered his parents' bedroom, saw his parents covered in blood. And when he looked down, a gun was in his hands. At the very same time, my cousin was having a dream in which she dreamed her son was coming in her bedroom and shooting her and her husband. That dream scared her so badly, she woke up, headed down the stairs to her son. Guess what? She met him coming up the stairs, no gun in his hands, but both were scared and fell down crying in each other's arms. A gun was kept upstairs, and the son knew where it was. 
Was something driving him toward the gun? Was something protecting the family? Your guess is as good as mine. Dennis in Kansas City, can you imagine that? A mother and a son having an identical dream of murder that came that close to consummating. You tell me what that is. Uh, so um, that is the spirit of it, if you will. And um, if you have a ghost story that you would like to share with the rest of the nation, we would love to hear it. And again, all I ask is that um, as I approach it, you too approach it in a serious vein, because this is a very serious subject. And this is the annual show we call ghost to go. So if you have a ghost story for us, uh, pick your line and uh, come ahead now. Here we go. Let's see what we can find throughout the night hours, the dark hours. East of the Rockies, you're on Ghost to Ghost AM. Hello there. No, you're not. Wild card line, you're on the air, Ghost to Ghost AM. Hi, Art. This is David in Bakersfield. Hi, David. Um, true story, 1984. It's around 84. I went down to Long Beach to visit my friend who's at uh, USC in, uh, in pre-med. And uh, while I was down there, she took me on a tour of the Queen Mary. Oh, yes. And I had never been to the Queen Mary and just had, you know, seen it on in movies and stuff, never heard anything about it before at all. So we go on the tour. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I go into museums or, or things like that, I always go where you're not supposed to go. So I... Got her, and I said, let's go over the, you know, the little rope railing, and we went down. And down um, at the bottom of the boat is a swimming pool, but it was empty. And you go down the, uh, the stairs, and we were down there, and, and Brenda's the type of girl that she, well, she's a doctor now, and she's very scientific and never believed in God, never believed in anything you couldn't see. And I had always been the kind of, the psychic wing, you know what I mean? And I didn't feel a thing. And we walked down to the pool, and she stopped, and she said, I feel strange. I feel something weird. And I, that was very strange for her to, to even think that, let alone say it. That's something that I would say. Right. So we go down, and we're just walking around the pool, and we look up, and there's a catwalk up there, a, a balcony. And there is a man in uh, coveralls, blue coveralls, with um, red hair and a red beard, and he's just uh, walking there. And I thought, oh, we're, now we're in trouble because we're not supposed to be down here. Mm -hmm. So um, I kind of just waved and said hi, and he had just he just, just kept staring straight and just was walking. And I thought, well, okay, great. Maybe he didn't see us. So I grabbed her, and we hid around the... Uh, post there, and I peeked right around the corner. He was in the middle of the catwalk, so I mean it's long, and I peeked right back around. The guy was totally gone. Um, about a year later, I'm watching some special on TV about the Queen Mary, and they had some actor portraying this certain spirit, and he, it was the exact same <laughs> guy <laughs> that they had described that he was yeah. crushed to death or something. Yes. On the, and I called her up and I said, turn on the TV. The guy who disappeared on this, this yep. is him. There he is. All right. Thank you very much for that. Well, exactly. So he proves my point. You see, people, uh, souls, maybe we ought to call them souls, who are abruptly terminated, uh, when even they don't expect it, don't seem able to find their way to where they ought to be going. Instead, they remain, or seem to remain, acting out as if uh, uh, from the damned, this surprising uh, end to their life, like a big tape loop. I guess all we can hope for them is that it's not really them that it's some sort of weak echo of an unexpected death 
First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hey, Art. Hello. This is Fred from South Pasadena. Yes, Fred. Hey, I have a great ghost story. Let her rip. Scared the heck out of me. Um, uh, when I was about 18, I moved to Ravenna, Ohio. And I moved in with some people who told me, uh, the lady told me she'd been a witch for some time. And Ravenna was where all the real witches from Salem moved to. Okay. And, uh... I mean, it's not every day that somebody admits to you, I'm a witch. Yeah. And she told me some things that scared me. She told me a lot of things about uh, things that happened to me when I was a kid. So it was very strange. She's so a nice person. She, she knew about you. Yes, she did. Okay. And, uh, but uh, she said, uh, you know, a lot of weird things happened there. All the real witches of Salem had moved to Ravenna, Ohio. And, uh, but... Why Ravenna, Ohio? Uh, she never told me that. But there were, there were weird things that happened there. Uh, like what? Um, big hives of bees stinging people and... Just, that was one of the things that I read. Uh, yes, I, I, I believe you, uh, sir, and I, I believe, uh, in a kind of a magic, um, which witchcraft, uh, really is, uh, mm -hmm. at least the form you're talking about. Sure. And uh, I believe, thank you, I believe there are curses. I believe it is possible to affect people. One person's mind can indeed affect another in a negative way. We talked about that the other night uh, with Brad Steiger, and he said, absolutely. Absolutely. So there are people who practice and play with that power. It is dark stuff. Indeed. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Uh, yeah, I've got a ghost story for you. All right. That's what we want. Where are you calling from? Uh, Janesville, uh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. All right. Go right ahead. Uh, yeah, when I was about 15 years of age, I lived over in uh, southwestern Minnesota near Pipestone. Yes, sir. And they've got an Indian reservation, you know, around that area. And a bunch of friends and I were out camping. And we're kind of around by a, a small little lake. And during the night, we started hearing, you know, uh, horses and these war cries. And so, I mean, we got up, we're out looking around, and we didn't see anything. And I stopped to lean up against the tree to light up my cigarette, and all of a sudden I hear this right next to my ear. Hmm. Well, I took off, you know, all of us scared out of our wits. We don't know what's going on. And the next morning we went back, and I went to the same tree, and I pulled an arrowhead right where I heard it hit. Wow. You mean it was the thump of an arrowhead hitting? Yes. And, and that's all that was left in the tree was the arrowhead itself, not the... Right. Hmm. The arrow had apparently broken off through the ears. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it gets better. Yes. We also were, you know, searching around the area, and we found a couple tomahawk heads. Yes. A bunch more arrowheads. Actual part of an arrow. And we went and saw one of the tribal men uh, for the Dakota tribe. Yes. And they said there was a battle there, and a lot of the uh, Native Americans. We're slaughtered there. You know, it was uh, it was a time flash. I mean, you were in a time flash. They occur, and uh, particularly in areas like that. And for a moment, just an instant, you were part of it. Yeah, either way, it scared the heck out of all of us. What do you think so. that means? Uh, wh what do you think that means about death? I mean, you know because you experienced it, so have many others. You were actually part of it. For a minute. I mean, it's like either time caught up with you or you went back in time. I have no way of knowing what, right, you know, we, um, but you were part of it. So what does that say about the nature of death, that we don't really exactly die, that, that events never really are done with, that they just keep repeating themselves again and again? Yeah, that's the only thing I can think of is uh, what the shaman said also. Mm. We thought talked to him also he took you know a couple of tomahawks that we found 
Well, it's something to think about. I, I thank you for the story, my friend. And you're in the spirit, all right. This, from the high desert, is Halloween and Ghost to Ghost AM. I broadcast from Nye County, Nevada. Nevada has an interesting history. Nevada, as a state, was born on Halloween. Did you know that? Nevada was born on Halloween. Tomorrow, in addition to being Halloween in this time zone, another 22 minutes, is Nevada Day. So, that's right, we are in the state that was born on Halloween. And perhaps that's why Nevada has the highest per capita murder rate, suicide rate, cancer rate in the country. Haven't you ever wondered? And here in Nye County, specifically in Wild West Nye County, we still have brothels. You know what a brothel is, right? It's a place where women sell themselves, here, legally. And I'm going to tell you a brief but true story about one of Nye County's brothels. I won't name it. They're a neighbor. The brothels are large. They um, are kind of catacombs of dimly lit hallways and small rooms where girls service their clients. This isn't ancient history. This is modern history. In one of the brothels, there has long been a ghost. Its name is Harold. It's a female ghost. Don't ask me why the name is Harold. But Harold has been in this brothel for as long as anybody can remember. Has been seen by wave after wave and shift after shift of working girls and there is a long legend uh, that is held to be true that those who see and are able to touch Harold's red dress will have a thousand dollar night and that has been long proven to be true who is Harold? don't know why does Harold inhabit that place? Again, I don't know. I'll leave that up to you. But I'm giving you a true story. It's here in Nye County, Nevada, close by. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. By the way, I'll be pleased to tell you that I am ordering a, uh, uh, the lecton, the, you know, the... The Levitron. Yeah. Right, Levitron. <laughs> Oh, my word, I got to make this. Anyway, I'm ordering one for my nephew for Christmas. Well, you'll enjoy it. It works. Yep. Uh, where are you calling from? Uh, Warner Robins, Georgia. All right. Do you have Small a ghost story for us? South of Macon. Mm -hmm. Sir, I'm going to preface what I was saying because this is a, a story that happened to my father, who is now deceased. My father was born in 1898 mm -hmm. outside of a very, very small town of Knoxville, Georgia. Yes, sir. And he was about four miles out of town on a farm. And there was a stretch of road there that runs between Knoxville, Georgia, and over to what is now I-75, 20 miles away, at a little town called Byron. And certain portions of this road were considered to be haunted. Now, the strange thing about it is, after the road was paved in 1923, yes, sir. all the haunting ceased. That is odd. Uh, I, I can understand that a road, uh, yeah. after all, people are killed on roads. Uh, on corners, particularly dangerous uh, yeah. areas, passing zones, all that sort of thing. Yeah, in other words, they have, there's a great assortment of stories called almost, in fact, they have been, somebody wrote them up years ago called Crawford County Tales. Mm -hmm. But anyway, this is my father, when he was about 10, 11 years old, was riding with his father, his younger brother, and a black man who worked on the farm with him mm -hmm. back, from, uh, back from town, headed home. Yes, sir. And as they crossed this, what they call Culpeper Creek, uh, they saw a head that a woman was walking in the middle of the road. Now, this was not unusual in the country in about 1910. Sure. And she wore the very typical, very country dress, uh, the long, long gingham dress, and she had a bonnet on, and in her arm was a market basket. Very common sight. Well, as they pulled up behind her, my grandfather 
kind of put to the mules and stuff and reined them back in so that, you know what I mean, when you got two mules pulling the wagon, you have the wagon tongue in the middle. Well, sure. Yeah, and so that the wagon tongue would not shift out as it does tend to sway and get the woman, in, you know, in the back. Yes, sir. And as he pulled the reins back and all four of them were witnessing, the woman completely vanished. <laughs> completely vanished. Yes. Uh, I don't, I, I don't if, I, if I had to bet, I would bet she had been killed on that road. It's, it's very possible. That was at least, I know of, oh, my gosh, I even had an uncle who committed suicide on that road. He was a mail carrier, a rural mail carrier, and he pulled up on the top of one of the higher hills, parked his car, and shot himself through the head, and then rolled on down the hill. Well, there's a thing about places. I don't know what it is, but there is a thing, sir, about places. I, I appreciate your call. I appreciate your story. And uh, of particular interest is that this haunting went on until the road was paved. Now, what does that tell us about the nature of hauntings? How could a paving stop it? First time caller line, you're on the air. Good morning. Happy Halloween, Art. This is Jen in Las Vegas. Oh, uh, well, happy Halloween to you. Um, yes, I have a true life ghost story for you. Um, I happened to me when I was about 17 years old. Okay. Um, I had a, a little boy. And I moved back in with, in my parents' house, and they just recently moved into a house in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to give you the address or anything. Thank you. Don't. <laughs> and um, my mother, after I moved into this house, they told me they heard voices. They heard a voice of a little boy, and he was, he was always in the backyard saying, where's my grandpa? Mm -hmm. And um, one night, my mother was coming downstairs to check on me and my son, and she saw a little boy run across right in front of the stairs. She yelled for my father. My father came downstairs to baseball bat. And nobody was there. Well, about three days after this, um, I recently put my son down for a nap, and I just got done doing laundry, and I folded all of his clothes. I went in there to put a load of laundry into my room, and all my all his clothes was unfolded. Huh. And um, so about about a week or so after that, um, my little brother was also living at the home at home with my parents at the time, and my son woke up, and I looked up the end of my bed. And I thought it was my little brother sitting at the end of my bed, and I asked him to go get me a bottle. And I just glanced that back down with my son, and I looked back up, and he was gone. He was gone? He was gone. <laughs> and then um, my son passed away in November. I'm sorry. And um, I went back home to my parents' house, and I was asleep in bed, and I woke up, and the little boy was standing there looking over to where my son usually slept. He slept with me. Right. And he looked at me, and he goes, where's the baby? And I was going to say, well, sweetie, I'm sorry, but my baby died today. And he looked at me, and he goes, I'm sorry. He goes, my grandpa died, too. And um, that was the last time I saw him. Wow. And a few weeks after that, a neighbor of mine, he, she lived in the neighborhood for since it was built. And I was asking her if a little boy ever lived there. And she told me about how a little boy came to spend the summer with his grandparents. And he was out playing in the road, and he got hit by a car. And they never heard about anything about the house or anything else. But after that, I mean, he was a very friendly ghost. He never really bothered us or anything. He just played, like, playful, playful little pranks. Now, he was a little boy about eight, nine years old. And, like, he said, there were the wear and stuff, stuff like that. And you'd walk through the house, and you'd feel cold spots through the house or anything. But yeah. he, was, he was very nice, you know. He well, was, I don't know. I don't know what that tells you, but there are um, there certainly are things that remain. I mean, it's not the end of life. One way or the other, things continue, yeah. and I'm sure that may comfort you uh, uh, somewhat. Uh, in a lot of ways, many of these stories are verification of life after death. Oh yes, I I really believe. I believe my son's in heaven and everything else. And but this little boy, I mean, he was constantly for his grandfather. And you know, I was kind of hoping that someday, you know, hopefully he would find his grandfather and he'd find his way over. I understand. I I very much appreciate the story. Thank you. Sure. We go on to where and to what I don't know. Some may remain. But what you will hear tonight will be. A consistent thread indicating there is obviously something that comes after this life. Wildcard Line, you're on the air. Hello. Hey, Art. How's it going? It's going fine. All right. This is Tony from Las Vegas. Hi, Tony. Two Las Vegas calls. In yeah. a row. Yes, sir. I got a 
couple of spine tanglers for you. Let her rip. Okay, well, there's this uh, park outside of St. Louis called uh, Rockwoods. Yes, sir. And uh, it's an old miner's place, bus silver joint, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, we went out there one night. You're not supposed to. Of course not. But we do. Mm-hmm. Just to have fun as teenagers. Of course. And uh, we were sitting down, just relaxing, enjoying ourselves, you know, just because it's scary out there, you know. It was around Halloween, too. Mm-hmm. But uh, we looked over, and there was nothing. It was dark. We would you, would you turn on. your, uh, would, before you go on, would you turn your radio off, please? Uh, it's, okay, yeah, hold on. Can you hold right. on? Oh, yes, yes. I'd, I'd rather hold on than have the radio going. It's uh, simply too confusing for all concerned to have it going on in the background. So have it close so you can turn it off right away. When you get on the air. Yeah, I'm here. All right, sir, go ahead. And uh, the skyline, you could see, because there was enough moonlight. It was very dark everywhere else, though. Sure. Like within the valleys and the tree line and all that. Right. It's darker and all get out. And uh, some dogs and uh, other animals seemed to be uh, barking. There was dogs barking, animals in the background over the hill. They had like a miniature zoo there at this park. Mm-hmm. Had like timber wolves and whatnot in it. And they were all barking. And the neighborhood dogs that were outside of the park limit, you could hear them, too. They're all going wild. All going crazy. I think animals sense things. So we were kind of concerned about that. Like, what are they doing, looking for somebody out here? Sure. Or what's disturbing them. Yeah, right. And then a light came over the top of the hill. We thought it was maybe one of the, you know, searchers or whatever. We assumed that there was somebody out there making a ruckus near us. Because the dogs were so close, Mm -hmm. and they were barking very loudly. Yes. (laughs) This light came over the hill, and we thought at first, you know, hey, no big deal. It's just maybe a park ranger. uh, It could be anything. Sure. We thought it was a flashlight, you know, initially. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, it was coming down the hill, and it seemed to be passing through the trees as if it was, you know, down like about the size of a man. Right. He'd be walking. Right. About 200 yards, about 100 yards away on the valley hill. And he was coming down. Kind of slowly, like a man walking. Yes. The light was about the size of a basketball, we started to notice. So we figured, hey, that's a pretty big light, you know? <laughs> this guy's got a big light out here. Yeah. And uh, we were getting concerned maybe we should get up and go. You know, maybe he's going to kick us out of the park if it's mm-hmm. a park ranger, mm-hmm. which we weren't sure of. When it got to the bottom of the hill, the dogs were still barking, needless to say. And when this guy got to the, well, we thought it was a guy, got to the bottom of the hill, the light went off. Then it came back on. Hmm. And we figured, hmm, what's he doing? He's trying to scare us out of the park or something, you know, right. just playing games. Then uh, it started to generally go back up from where it came. I noticed something strange about this light, though, when it came back on. It was going back up the hill, same kind of way it came down. It was pointed towards us because it didn't, wasn't getting a lip, you know, it was pure round. It wasn't elliptical. I understand. And so it was like maybe facing us or it was three-dimensional. So what do you think it was? Well, when it started going up the hills, I noticed another thing. There weren't any trees passing by it this time. So it had to be above the tree line. Well, we didn't figure that out really right away because we were just not thinking things like that. When it got to the top of the hill, it didn't go over the ridge. Like it initially appeared on the ridge, but yes. it went above the ridge. You could see the skyline, the stars in the background. It was about the size of a basketball. It went up slowly, as slowly as it walked up, you know, went up the hill. There was nothing around the light. The light did not blind you like a normal bright light that would be facing you. So what do you think it was? It, well, it stopped, then it took a right, and it started to move slowly, like a monster light, like, and it moved on. When it did that, we both, we all got up. And we took off running to the car, needless to say, we got the heck out of there. That's one story. And that was, oh, well, that really got the so you have on no, our back. So you have no idea what it was? I assume it was an entity or a ghost, you know. But I'm not a big ghost believer, but now I am after that. And another incident that I had that this one's really brief, I'll make it really brief. There was a lightning strike out one day during a storm out in front of my house. Mm-hmm. The lightning was really... It was a loud crash, and I ran out of the room, scared, you know, out of my wits. Um, but uh, before I ran out of the room, a small piece of the lightning, I forget what they call it, it's, a, it's a, the physics of lightning, a small piece of lightning came off and hit the lamp in the room. <laughs> so I ran out on all fours. The next day, the next day, I went in that room 
to replace a light bulb because the lamp needed one. I'm sure it did. No lights. So I went and got a light bulb and went up to put it on. There was no light in the room. Nobody was home that day. The light bulb fell out of my hand, hit the ground. I saw it. I knew there was enough light coming in from the other room to where I could see the light bulb bounce a few feet. So I went and I looked for it. Couldn't find it. Got a flashlight. Looked through it for two, three hours. I looked for it. There was two radiators in there. I looked under them and everything. There was no furniture in there because we were remodeling. Okay. Very, you know, I thought somebody was playing a trick on me. So when I finally found the light bulb and there was nobody home. It was jammed behind the radiator in amongst the paneling that covers a radiator. Hmm. And there was, I checked it out and there was no way it could have rolled under. The, the space be- underneath the radiator was not big enough for a light bulb to roll under. It was physically impossible. I've, I've got you. All right. Well, maybe it was some sort of um, force that lingered from that branch of the lightning that you talked about. It's hard to say. It's really hard to say. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Uh, good evening, Art. Good evening. Uh, this is Chris from CTAC. Hi, Chris. And I'm calling to tell you about an incident that happened when I was a teenager. About a sophomore in high school, my mother was teaching in a little town called Midville, Idaho, between Boise and Moscow. Sure. Up in the mountains. And when we got up there that year for her to teach, there was no place for her to rent but this big old house on a, a small farm with a big, long horse barn. And this was a very strange house. It, I guess it had been used as a hotel at one time. And so it had lots and lots of little rooms in it upstairs. And uh, my brother slept downstairs in one room, my mother in another room. And, and all the cats and dogs stayed down there, but I chose to stay on the second floor. And a little room next to a stairway that went up to a catwalk on top of the house, the square. And I had a window in my tiny bedroom on that side of the house. And one night, it was real bright moonlight. And I took a chance to walk up on the catwalk to see, you know, it was so beautiful out in the valley and around. And then I went back down and stepped into my bedroom and I down on my bed. The moonlight was shining in real strong through my window underneath it. And, uh, okay, we don't have a lot of time. Okay, Chris. there was a boy sitting on the end of my bed. And oh. I thought, well, I never even had friends over, let alone boys. But I never thought anything strange about this at the time. And he started talking to me, and he said, you know, he said, I slept in this room once. He said, uh, mm-hmm. I was riding for the Pony Express. And he said, and I was shot and killed. Now, wait a minute. Uh, how could a boy be in a room where he shouldn't be in your house and you not think anything strange about it. I didn't at the time, but the more I got to thinking about it later on... I mean, why weren't you saying to yourself, what is this guy doing here? (laughs) I know I should have, but I I felt no uneasiness, no unrest. I was just listening sort of compassionately to him telling his story about how he had stayed there and he had been shot and killed. Well, that should have tipped you off also. So that he couldn't finish his run. But what really got me, made my hair stand on end, was, you know, then I turned over and went to sleep like nobody had been there. And the next day, I went down to check my rabbits that were in the horse barn, you know. Right. And I reached up above a stall in order to step over some of my rabbits, and I pulled down a rusted old pistol. Oh, you're kidding. No. Huh. I appreciate the story, dear. Thank you. Um, I guess it may be that you would have to imagine that an entity has a way of putting the person it decides to be in the presence of at ease. There would be no other way to explain that. Otherwise, she should have been utterly startled. I mean, with somebody just appearing in your house where they ought not be, that is at the very least a break-in and something you would normally be immediately concerned about. But there may be a way that these things put you at ease so people don't have heart attacks, so that people don't die on the spot of fright. And believe me, believe me, it's possible to die of fright. So maybe in making their appearance, uh, these entities uh, have a way of calming you. I suppose, uh, one might suggest, as a spider may paralyze and calm its victim, 
and sort of store it and keep it for a while, but not with that same intent in mind. Otherwise, you'd have a heart attack and you'd, you'd die of fright. So you simply accept it and listen instead. Interesting. All right, this is Ghost to Ghost. Ghost stories all night long. When we return here in the Western Time Zone, it's going to officially be Halloween as the stories continue. I'm Art Bell, and this is Ghost to Ghost AM. Kingdom of Nye, more Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. Here again is Art. On the first time caller line, you're on the air on Ghost to Ghost AM. Good morning. Good morning. How are you and where are you? Hi, I'm Laura from Coolidge, Arizona. All right, welcome to the show. What have you? Oh, my friend told me this story. It happened about seven years ago. She was sleeping with her husband, and her husband was a Native American, and you know they're kind of spooky or something. <laughs> But anyway, they were sleeping, and she woke up. And no, dear, they're spiritual. Yeah, they're, okay. yeah. And um, she woke up, and there was like a bull's head or a demon-looking thing hanging over her bed. And she heard um, a voice coming out of it that was not um, not English. She couldn't understand what it was saying, but she was petrified. She said she couldn't move at all. Huh. And after a little bit, she was able to move. And she looked at her husband, and his mouth was mouthing the words. And the voice was oh coming from my. his mouth. So finally she was able to wake him. And when she woke him, he jumped out of bed. Yes. told her that the devil was after her. And um, she told him that she saw it. So I guess they got a little bit of sleep that night. Well, maybe spooky is a better word, actually, under the circumstances. That's really strange. So either he was possessed by or projecting that entity. Something happened, but that's not it. So the next day, she went um, to work next door at, for an old folk, you know, cleaning his house and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he went to work when she looked out the window, and her trailer was on fire. My and God. it burnt to the ground. Oh, my God. Really? Yes. I have the picture and the paper and everything. It came out in the paper, and they said it was an electrical fire. But um, they put another trailer on that property, but they had the witch doctor come out and bless it. I wouldn't rebuild on that property for all the tea in China. No, I wouldn't either. <laughs> I wouldn't either. My hair stood up on the back of my neck last year when I was listening to your Halloween show, and a lady called in and described practically the same thing that she had told me. And, boy, I didn't sleep at all that night. I was that right up in bed. And well, there's a good sleep. reason for that, you see. That's because these things are real. Oh, I knew when she told me, I knew she was telling me the truth. Mm -hmm. She didn't I, lie. I appreciate your call. Thank you. Now, you tell me, was he projecting that, or was it something within him? I, n I don't know. I'm not sure. And I'm not sure that was a ghost, either. That may have been closer to pure evil. Wild Card Line, you're on the air. Good morning. Hi, Art. Hello. Hi, this is Diane in Hansford, the one with the frog story. Oh, yes, Diane. Welcome yeah. to the show. Well, hello. I have two really good ghost stories. One that happened in a small mining town in Ohio when I was a child. My aunt and uncle had rented a house. The old man that had lived in it was sent off to a nursing home against his will mm. and swore that he would come back. Well, he died in the nursing home. They moved in, and strange things began to happen. They would smell cabbage boiling. Mm. They would hear footsteps going down the hallway and the toilet flush in the middle of the night. And, of course, no one was there. Well, I went over to spend the night with my cousins, and my girl cousin and I woke up in the middle of the night to find two greyhounds standing in the bedroom with their leashes sticking straight up in the air. Oh, that's bad. We were like five or six years Very old. Very bad. So, I left. I wanted to go home. What transpired after that was one night my aunt was bathing one of the children in the kitchen sink, and she looked out the back door. And there was a man standing there, and she kept calling to him to answer her. 
he wouldn't answer her, so she went and got the shotgun mm. and fired point blank through the door. Well, the neighbor guy came running to find out what was going on, and, of course, there was no one there. When she gave the description, he described it as the old man that lived there. The next day, my aunt, why she didn't leave, I don't know, but <laughs> the next day she had made the comment that she was going to go out and pick the grapes that were on the vines yes. and make some jelly. So she got up bright and early to go out and pick the grapes, and they were all withered on the vines. Uh-huh. They moved shortly thereafter. I don't blame them. Uh, thank you very, very much for the story. Uh, it's easy to say, if I was so scared by something, that I would pick up a shotgun and fire blankly through a door, I'd be the hell out of there. But in reality, we have lives. Homes, apartments, places where we live, and uh, deposits, and the real things of life, telephones, Mail delivery, a million things that tie us to a place. So what we tend to do is rationalize what has occurred. Explain it away in our own minds so we don't have to do what we really think we ought to do. And that is get the hell out of there. On the other hand, two or three experiences may be more than enough. You might rationalize one, but not two or three. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Bell. Hi. Where are you? Uh, I'm in Canton, Ohio. My yeah. name's Adam. Okay, Adam. Happy Samhain, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't. I don't know if this is going to be a really exciting story, but it's a. It's a real one, anyway. That's what counts. Yeah. Um, I remember this distinctly, despite my age. I was only five years old. Um, I was asleep at night, and I just woke up, and I really don't know why. I just, for some reason, just got up and I was awake as if I had, you know, gotten up on a regular morning. Sure. And um I well, had lived with my grandparents in Was the this home. the uh, middle of the night when you woke up? Yeah, actually. Okay. Um it was more toward the middle of the night than the morning and um I I got up and then I just for I don't didn't know why. Um I looked around and I couldn't find my mother or anyone around. I went through the house and finally found um all of the, my family members for some reason and you know, it was odd them being there that night. And they were all sitting around, and they all seemed, you know, really sad. And I asked what was wrong, and no one would tell me. So I got a drink of water like a good little kid and went to bed. Mm-hmm. And when I was asleep, I was trying to go to bed, and I looked up at some point and saw something at the foot of my bed. This is a very common story, I'm sure. Um, it looked kind of greenish-white, and I just, you know, as a you know, I just saw that, and I just, you know, got scared and just put the covers over my head. Natural reaction. And just sat there trembling. Yes, and, you know, and then, you know, as I started to calm down, I realized it looked like my grandfather for some reason. So I, like, peeked back out after a couple minutes, <laughs> yes. and there was nothing there. So I just, you know, I was a little kid. I was tired. I, you know, I just went to bed, back to sleep. So I woke up the next morning, and apparently what had happened is my grandfather had started feeling chest pains. Oh. And he had gone uh, to the emergency room. He, uh, he, your, grandfather, your grandfather had been in the house or not? Did yeah, he... he lived with us, okay. both of my grandparents. I see, did. all right. And he had gone to the emergency room. Uh, he had had chest pains, and he didn't want to go, but my grandmother got him to go. Sure. And he had gone down there, and uh, he was in the emergency room, and it was his time to come up. And apparently um, he felt someone else there needed help more than he did. The person obviously was more ill. Yes. So he, he had them go ahead and go through. And uh, finally, when they got to him, you know how things are in an emergency room, um, he walked in, and as he was walking in, he collapsed, and he was dead. On the spot? On the spot. So. Well, he came to see you. I, I Apparently. Yeah, he came to see you, sir. I, I appreciate the call. Thank you. He came to see you. There's a million stories like that. As you look into the question of whether there is life after death, this is one of the most repetitive kind of stories you will hear. Relatives? Loved ones, family, will die suddenly. And those close who had no idea that they were even in jeopardy will see them because they will come to visit one more time. Proof? Something you can scientifically lay your hands on? No. Enough stories so you can believe it is true? Absolutely. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, I'm calling from Wenatchee. Well, welcome. Washington. 
Yes. Um, and I'm not sure if this is a ghost story, but it scared the heck out of me. All right. <laughs> I was um, asleep one night, and I was having a nightmare that somebody was trying to kill me. And I uh, tried to wake up because I knew I was dreaming. But mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden I felt like like somebody was had just put their knee or pressure on the bed. Oh. And that just scared me so bad, and I was struggling really, really hard to wake up. And I finally was able to open my eyes, and at, there was no no one on the side of the bed, but at the foot of the bed was, I could see a man from the waist up, but he was in light. It was like, it was a negative, but but uh, where where it should be light, it was dark. It, yeah, and and where and where where, where it was light, dark, it was really I've, bright. I've got you. And he was moving around. I could see his. I could see the outline of his of his face and his features and and all that. And he was moving around doing stuff. And all I could do was just. I kept saying, "I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I don't want to know." And I looked over and I, I had turned on my light, and I looked at my clock and I looked back and he was still there. And that's that's bad. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I went to sleep. I was hoping I would forget it, and I have never been able to forget it. But I don't know what it was. Well, how long did he remain? At some point, oh. he, he had to go away, right? Yeah, it was. It was. I don't know. Several minutes. You know what? What? You're lucky you weren't attacked. I know. Because that's what it may have been. Well, do you know what happened though? Then about five months later, because this happened last year, and then about five months later. I was sitting here in my dining room with my back to the sliding window, uh-huh. and I kept thinking I was hearing something outside, and I sit here with my door open a little bit to blow the smoke out, and I got up to get a cup of coffee, and I went over and I sat back down, and all of a sudden I just thought, oh, my God, I knew somebody was behind me. Mm-hmm. And I insta- I mean, I was just terrified. I got up, and I went to get another cup of coffee, you know, <laughs> And I thought, I guess I better replace the, the lights on my patio. And I went out to my laundry room, to, which is right next to the slider, yeah. to get a light bulb. And when I reached over to turn on the light, there was a man there. Oh, bad. He had been within five feet of me. And the police came, and they found his footprints all around my house. And I kept thinking, well, maybe it was just, maybe it was lucky. I don't know. <laughs> I appreciate the call. Thank you. Yes, creepy in both circumstances. What was that man at the foot of her bed? I don't know. But the pressure that she felt indicates that there could have been an attack. By a ghost? No. By an evil entity? Yes, possibly so. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm calling from Kelso, Montana. Okay, welcome to the show. You're going to have to get close to the phone because you're not very loud. Huh? Okay, thank you. All right, go, um, go right ahead. Thank you. Several years ago, um, we lived on a ranch, and we had had a great big old house. It, was, it looked like almost like a plantation. We had a um, long pillars and everything, and it was kind of scary. One L- night, like an old southern plantation yeah, house. It did. Yeah, it really. It had a, you know the top had like five bedrooms. Oh, I know. I've lived in a house like it, that. It had yes. an old wood stove. You know, we had to chop wood for it and everything. And, yes. And uh, really liked it, but it was spooky. One night, uh, my mother had to leave, and she was going to be gone overnight. I had a girlfriend come stay with me. Mm-hmm. And uh, we stayed up and watched TV till it was no more television, and <laughs> we went upstairs. I had my bedroom upstairs, and it was a nice evening. It was summer, and it was moonlit night, and uh, we're talking and laughing and telling stories as girls will. And all of a sudden, I, I heard something outside, and I, I there was an old tree had grown there, and it was real close to my window, some of the limbs, and I thought, well, the wind must have come up. It's knocking against that window, and we looked, and it wasn't. And I kept listening and listening, and I thought, well, that is a very familiar sound. And she said, well, what is it? And I said, oh, my God, it, it sounds like somebody's chopping wood. We had a, a wood pile right outside um, the sure. house there on the back, sure. by close to the back porch. And I chopped a lot of wood, so I knew what that sound was. You bet. And we just looked at each other. We were just, like, horrified. And I thought, well, we, we've got to go see what this is, you know. So we went downstairs, and... I think she had a baseball bat, and I probably had a butter knife or something, and we walked outside this old porch and got to the end of it, and there was a very large, about a 500-gallon propane tank, a white one, at the end of this porch. Oh, yes. The sound is still continuing, only it's loud, and it's definitely... 
something, just chopping wood. And I'm going, oh, my God, you know. And so we, we were too scared to step off the porch and look around the house. And all of a sudden, the noise stopped. And we're just, like, frozen right there. And I looked over. We're looking towards the propane tank. The moon is just right. And all of a sudden, there's this long, dark shadow, and it's floating. And it's in the shape like of a person. It had a head and shoulders. It looked like a man's shadow, a very tall one. And it's floating across that propane tank towards us. Damn. And we screamed and <laughs> ran to the door, and I grabbed the door, and she would shove me out of the way, and she grabbed the door. And we were out there like five minutes just trying to get in the house. We finally got in. We stayed awake all night. I was so scared. The next day we went out, and there, there was wood had been chopped, and it was thrown just thrown all over the the barnyard and all over the yard, and it was. I wish they'd have stacked it. That would have been nice. <laughs> Whatever in the hell was out there, it wasn't good. No, it wasn't, and it was. It was just. It was. I never stayed there alone again with without my mother there anyway. So. Well, let me tell you, teenage girls are dangerous things. <laughs> yeah. They really are, and yeah. uh, I've had a number of guests lately, uh, all of which have confirmed that teenage girls project things mm. because they are so emotional their hormones are raging mm -hmm. uh, you know I call it the carry syn syndrome mm. but teenage girls project things well, and that may be what you did that that might have been or it, something may have been after you right yeah within that home there were odd things that would happen sometimes I'd be at my room and uh, someone would call my name and say, come here, and I would be like playing the guitar or something, and I'd say, well, didn't want to be bothered, and I'd say, what do you want? It sounded like my mother. Three or four times this would happen. I'd finally go downstairs disgusted. They wouldn't tell me, and there wouldn't be anybody in the house. It was mm -hmm. just me. So the, the old home had belonged to a, a very large family. They built it in the 1800s, and uh, they were still there, I think. <laughs> were you uh, a pretty hyperactive teenage girl? Um, hyperactive. Uh, no, actually, I was very calm. Um, very well, calm, I mean, cool. inner, inner, inner emotions boiling. Yeah, I, yeah, I was probably, yeah, as, yeah. Well, there's been a lot of studies about teenage girls. I'm telling you, mm -hmm. they project things, and so that may, it may have been that, or, or uh, it may be that you were very lucky not to have gone out there right, right. any earlier, lest yeah. you would have been the one chopped. That's true. You know, we thought of that. We thought, oh, my God, you know, I'm glad we, you know, didn't go any further than the end of that porch. And, um, but we were just, we were just terrified. I just, you know, stayed completely, I don't think we even went outside till, you know, the sun was completely up and it yep. was warm. And These things uh, impress you for all their, all your life, don't yeah, they? Yes, it did. I still remember it. I can just almost see this, you know. You I never, think. ever forget. No, no. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, I've got to run. I want to thank you for the call. It thank has you. been a pleasure, and that was a good story. Thanks a lot. You Bye -bye. take care. This is Ghost to Ghost AM, and we'll be back. <laughs> remember this? Anybody out there remember this? One big eye. I Mr. Shaking in the city. It looks like a purple people eater to me. It was a one eyed, one horn flying purple people eater. One eyed, one horn flying purple people eater. A one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people eater Sure looks strange to me One-eyed Well, he came down to earth and he lit in the tree I said, Mr. Purple People Eater, don't eat Don't touch that dog I heard him say in a voice so gruff I wouldn't eat you cause you're so tough It was a one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people eater One-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people eater All right, this is Ghost to Ghost AM It is all night long, nothing but your Real ghost stories. And so back to it we go. First time caller line, you're on the air, top of the morning to you. Yes, good morning, Art, and my mom says hello, too. We, we both love your show. Hi to your mom, too. Oh, okay, great. Where are, oh, she's right there. Where are you? Uh, in Albany, Oregon. All right. And uh, this has happened, oh, 83, 84. I was in the Navy at the time, mm -hmm. uh, out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, on an aging oiler called the U.S. NS Pathumpsic. I'll be darned. And uh, I was a signalman, and there was myself and another signalman were up in the signal bridge. The front part of the signal bridge um, is fairly open and spacious and everything, mm -hmm. but the area in back was very narrow. And there's just like a small walkway. 
we were both sitting in what we call the signal shack and in the back part area and there was a doorway right near right in this room mm-hmm. and the ship being old and everything like that i mean there was no way we ran this one up down sideways whichever you know uh trying to figure this one out afterwards but uh and it could have been someone trying to play a trick but we really don't think so because you know we could hear anybody sneaking around sure you know, i mean it's just that type of a ship but we were sitting there, and all of a sudden, on this door, on this hatch, you know, we start hearing this knocking, you know, not, and it wasn't none of this, you know, friendly, hi, how are you, open up the door, let me in type knock. Sure. It was a steady bang, 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 you know, and it was like, you know, I mean, made my willy hairs stand right on end. Understood. Uh, <laughs> you know, but we thought, you know, I mean, like, we opened up the door, and there was no one there, and... You know, we thought, oh, hi, you know, okay, someone's, you know, playing a joke. Messing around with us, sure. Right. And, uh, well, we're out in the middle of the ocean. It's bound to get boring. But um, the thing is, is that we didn't hear anybody wandering around. We looked up on top. We weren't running around. It's the middle of the night. Well, ships are as likely a place as any for a haunting, maybe more likely than most. Well, yeah, I was also on the forest fall, and we had, like, you know, there was a big fire on there, and we had well over a hundred and some people get killed. I recall. And, uh, but the thing was is that we closed the door and after looking around, and then it was like, oh, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes later, this, you know, knocking came back and, you know, we started, you know, it's like calling out, knock it off you guys, and it just kept on going. Of course. And I ran out one, you know, I went out to the front part of our, our signal shack and went out another access door. My other signalman, he went out the other access door. We found not a soul. And hmm. let me, you know, we had a, we were supposed to have a, what we call a sleeping mid-watch. In other we words, you, a, you came back at it from both directions to catch what, whoever it was. Right. You know, and the there. only way, if there would have been someone up there, they would have, the only way they would have been able to get off of the bridge without being seen was to jump off of the bridge. And that would have, you know, that was like about a 20-foot drop. I've got you. So and, uh, it, it was something, but you don't know what. We, you know, we looked around. We, you know, even for something, you know, a uh, uh, loose wire or something like that, we never found anything. But uh, it made for a few sleepless nights. I'm sure it did. Crazy. I'm sure it did, especially at sea, which is kind of an eerie thing anyway. Thank you very much for the call. It is a little eerie to be at sea. There's nothing around. Or is there? This is CBC. Wildcard Line, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, this is Art. Yes, it is. Yeah, hi, Art. My name's Tom, and I'm uh, out here in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm a second-year law student. Uh, Good, Tom. Well, I'm originally from Kodiak, Alaska. Ah, yes. Yeah, and uh, we've got a lot of listeners up in Kodiak. Yeah, yeah. My uncle might be listening up there in Anchorage right now. I don't know, but uh, anyway, this incident happened uh, almost a year ago. It was in uh, on October 24th, 1995. Mm-hmm. And um, I was at the law school. I was a first-year student, and I was uh, talking with a friend of mine. He's also a law student. He's a minister too. And we happen to be talking about heaven and hell and the afterlife, things like that. And, uh, that invites it. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of odd because we it's not hadn't odd. really talked much like that. Before. No, it's not odd. It invites it. Anyway, go ahead. Okay, so the time rolled around, and it was about uh, uh, four in the afternoon, and I went to my civil procedure class here, which is kind of a boring class. It's just how to run a trial and do discovery, that kind of stuff. Sure. And, uh, I used to fall asleep in that class sometimes. I understand. And um, I was sitting there, and about... Uh, a little, little ways into the class, I just uh, kind of was getting real drowsy. And started, thought I was drifting off, and all of a sudden, about an arm's length in front of me, in front of my seat, I kind of felt or saw it. I don't know what it was. It's kind of, I don't know if I saw it or felt it, but it was at arm's length. It was about the size of a basketball, and uh, I felt like it was my mother was there, and she was saying, hi, son, and then it was like she was saying goodbye, son, and uh, 
It, it was about a minute. In the middle of a class. The middle of a class. And, uh, I didn't know if I was hallucinating or what, but I came to and I was very alert at that point. I understand. And, um, the adrenaline suddenly pumping real hard. <laughs> real hard, real hard. And yep. it lasted maybe a minute or so. Uh -huh. The air looked a little swirly. Uh, it seemed swirly. I don't know if I really saw it or was just feeling it or what. But yes. At, at the end of that experience, which lasted maybe a minute or so, this thought entered my mind, and it said, well, when you get home, if one of your sisters called and says, and, and, and your wife says she was real upset, that was your mom visiting you in class. And, uh, was your mom alive? Um, she was, and uh, but she was in the terminal stages of cancer. Oh, I see. And, uh, as soon as I got home, my wife Lisa said, Tom, one of your sisters called, and she was real upset. She wants you to call her back. Oh it's funny, it was the same language that I heard in my mind, you know. And, uh, so I you called called up Teresa right away. What happened, Teresa? She said, Mom passed away about an hour and 15 minutes ago, something like that. Yep. And it was exactly the same time when, when she you visited saw, me in yes. class. In, in the middle of a, a, a busy but boring class. Yeah, the whole procedure class, and uh, it was just... There's, no, there's no question in your mind, is there, that that was your mother? No question, because I've never had an experience like that before or since. Yeah. And uh, it's just like she came came and said, uh, actually, actually, when she visited me, it was about an hour and 15 minutes after she had passed away California time. I've got and, you. And it was just beautiful, because I knew that she came. And, and the weird thing was, the night before that happened, I was just in terrible grief and just weeping and mourning, even before she passed away. And, uh, you knew it was coming. I guess I could feel it, yeah. but uh, it just assures me that she's somewhere on the other side waiting for us, and we're going to be with her someday. And there is no question about it, sir. I, I thank you for the story, and there is no question about it. How many of those do you have to hear before you begin to conclude that this is real, that this life is not the end? We don't know what lays on the other side. Uh, there's no way to know that, but there's something. It's not a complete ending. It's not a great blank. It's not a dead-end street. There's something that goes on after this life. And how many of those stories do you have to hear before you begin to understand it is true? East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hello, Art. Hi. Uh, this one is, uh, uh, I've heard, all the, heard about the ghost tracks like, uh, all through my life. And I've never been out there. I've heard, you know, several people that go out there. And my daughter and her boyfriend, they went out there about, oh, uh, I don't, wait, wait a minute. Where is out there and what are ghost trips? Okay. San Antonio, deep south San Antonio off of South Crescent Street. You might be familiar with it since you were down here for basic training. <laughs> well, you're right, I was. But that, that was sort of like a, a hell on earth, as I recall it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. They're called the ghost traps. <clears throat> and I had my daughter research it. And it turns out that in the 1940s, on an afternoon, a uh, school bus was taking some kids home that lived down in that area. Right. It was around the old missions, uh, south around San Antonio River. Oh, yes. South of town. And what happened is, uh, as they were going over the track into their little neighborhood, the dang bus stalled, and this darn train couldn't stop in time. They didn't have road crossings back then, track crossings and stuff, warnings. Right. And it hit the bus, and it... Uh, killed the driver, I understand, and all the children that were left on the bus. Oh, my. So I had my daughter and her boyfriend show me how to get out there last Saturday just to go see, you know, before I gave you a call. And uh, she researched it, and we went out there, and you go up across the tracks, and you can, I was very skeptical. I was looking at the lay of the land and everything. Right. And there's a level area right there in the road, and it's level all the way to the tracks, and... You can see where the tracks are above the road. So I thought, okay. So I parked 30 foot away from the tracks, put my truck in neutral, and nothing happened. I said, about that time, I told Glenn, I said, look, you know, what's going on? Nothing's happening. At that time, my truck starts getting pushed. I mean, that's the only way you can describe it is pushed. Well, no, the, your truck was pushed? My truck was being pushed. I'm, I'm sitting on level ground on the street. And oh, the next thing I gee. know, my truck is being pushed. And by the time we reach the track, now this is only a little 30-foot distance, I'm going at a pretty good clip, about 15 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour, 
and I'm wanting to put on my brakes. He says, no, 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 don't put on your brakes. They say if you put on your brakes that your windshield shatters. Well, I didn't want to go into the expense of buying a windshield for the truck, so I didn't. There were about five or six other cars that were there, had been there ahead of us. And the deal is people go over there and they will put baby powder on the trunks of their cars. We well, made another trip. Why do they wait? Why do they put baby powder? Because the uh, the legend is, or the story is, that's why they call it the ghost tracks. That the children, if you uh, stop there, that they will push you over the tracks. And I swear to God, push you over the tracks. They now, push you over the tracks. Was there was not a train coming? Was there? No, no, there's no trains coming. All right. So what you think is going on? is that the spirit of these children doesn't want to ever see anybody ever get stuck there, and they push you over. That's the only thing I can figure, because there are handprints in the powder on the trunks of the cars that were Oh, there. I've got you now. That's why the powder, and you see handprints there. Right, yes, sir, and there's oh small my. handprints. There were kindergarten to high school oh kids, from what I understand, on the bus. They're not large adult handprints that, you know, somebody might have just stuck on there. There are small ones to, you know, larger handprints. How did you have the guts to try it? Just because everybody has and nobody's ever been harmed. You know, this is the thing. It's, they're not harmful ghosts. They're, they're like looking out for your welfare, you know, your benefits. I understand. And uh, it's really creepy. I thought, you know, okay, yeah, sure. But I've heard about it for all these years. Uh, we went into the neighborhood. They had named the streets after the uh, children that were killed on the bus. Uh, Shane, Bobby Allen, Cindy Sue, Nancy Carroll, Laura Lee, and uh, Ricky Otis. And then there's some more children uh, further up in the neighborhood, but I just didn't want to That is around. a re- No, that's a remarkable story. Yeah, that, well, it's, that uh, really is. it's uh, in the history books. Uh, from what I understand, my mother had seen a couple of programs since this is Halloween week, and it's been uh, ever, uh, shown on TV. Uh, locally and also on some nationwide uh, news. news well, I really on. appreciate your telling us the story. Uh, San sure Antonio, is. San Antonio has a very rich old history, so I am not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh-huh, you're welcome. Take care. Uh, now there's a good one. That's a good one, with little handprints on the back of the cars. It kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it, about the nature of life after death? Whether we remain in substance as we were in life, young or old, why we remain, it should have you asking questions of yourself. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Um, I'm Terry out of uh, Kapolei, Hawaii. Oh, Hawaii. Hi, Terry. Um, I got a story. It's not quite as uh, sweet as the uh, last one was, but it's... Uh, Kind of demonic, I guess you could say. <laughs> well, that, uh, I don't, it was sweet. The last one, in a way, was sweet, and it indicates one thing about life after death. You say yours is demonic? Yeah. All right, go ahead. It, it didn't actually, it didn't actually happen to me. It, it happened to an aunt of mine. My mother told me the story. Yes. Um, there was a time when, uh, they were all young, about, I guess, 10 or 10, between 10 and 15 years old. Is this in Hawaii, by the way? No, this is in Ohio. All right. Okay, um, she uh, was told by my grandmother to go down into the cellar, and at that time the cellars were not, you know, nice cinder blocks or anything like that. There was just dirt. She was told to go down to the cellar and uh, get some potatoes for dinner. Well, she didn't want to. She's being kind of rebellious, I guess. And uh, well, she got yelled at. My grandmother said, you know, get your butt down there and go get them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you know, how kids are. You know, she was walking away. She was going down the stairs to go down to the cellar, and she was cussing and saying, you know, go to go to hell. Not not saying nice stuff. things, yeah. Right, exactly. And uh, she went down there, and she's, you know, picking up the, uh, the potatoes and putting them in a basket and whatnot. And she heard the, <laughs> hears these footprints behind her. But they're more like um, what you would imagine the sound of, like, Frankenstein walking up from behind you, the thud, thud. kind of a thing. Well, she turned around. Thuds are bad. Yeah, thuds are bad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, she turned around, and she screams at the top of her lungs, and she goes running up the stairs. She's crying, and she just, you know, she looks like she just saw a ghost. Yep. Well, my grandmother's asking her, what, did you, what happened? What happened? She said, I just saw the devil. And she's describing him, you know, he was, you know, like seven feet tall or whatever, and, you know, my grandmother's scolding her for t- uh, telling a lie. Yeah. She's like, she's really very adamant about this. And she said, you know, he was half goat, he had hooves and all this other stuff. Oh, my. And they said, okay, well... 
so they went downstairs to look. They? My my grandmother and my grandfather right. went downstairs to look. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, in the dirt and the cellar were hoof prints. <laughs> really? <laughs> so this really gets weird. Uh-huh. You can see the hoof prints. They just kind of start, like right, you know, they're, they're, they start at the wall and they kind of go up to right to where she was standing. They turn back around and go right back into the same same corner. And there was like a ho- half a hoof print between the wall and the dirt. You know, it was like half half was there and half was inside the wall. Oh, no. So whatever this was, it hoofed its way right through the wall. Oh, man, that would be it for me. <laughs> yeah, I think so, yeah. God, that's an incredible story. It was, a, it was pretty bizarre. By the way, yep. uh, I hope to hear it during the night, but there are some very good um, ghost stories that have and always will be part of Hawaii. Yeah. It's a very eerie place. But that story, that was a good one, sir. Thank you. You have a good day, Art. All right. Hoof marks in the basement. I don't think so. Hoof marks, and then a half hoof mark right at the basement wall. Hmm. Are you still drinking tap water? Well, you deserve better than that. Your body is 75% water. Your brain, 85%. You are what you drink. Bottled water is simply not much better. It leaches things from the plastic into the water. Tap water can have chlorine, chemicals, lead, even cryptosporidium. So you don't want tap water straight. You don't want bottled water. Not good. What you do want is good, clear, uh, flowing, filtered water. And that's what you get with the WaterPure countertop system. It installs in about a minute. It filters out chlorine, lead, chemicals, and parasites at 99%. When you get it, you hook it up and draw a glass of water. And then draw one from the tap and compare the two. You'll be sold. Believe me, you'll be sold. Right now, we've got a $40 savings on the price of the main system itself. It's $119.95. That really is a good deal. As a matter of fact, this sale will end soon, so don't wait. Now, coming with this at that price, free of charge is the travel filter, a $30 value, free. Then, if you call before noon, which I'm sure you will do, you get a chlorine test kit. So, you can test your water. And you can, you can check out the chlorine levels, and then you can install your countertop system, and you will be a happy camper. Because you will have clean, filtered water, an absolutely continuing Endless supply of it. It is the best way. It's better than bottled water. Believe me. Call them before noontime at 1-800-313-PURE. That's 1-800-313-PURE. Pure. All right, you're listening to Ghost to Ghost AM. Uh, this means that we tell ghost stories all night long. It is Halloween. And as I told the earlier audience, it is also the birth date of the state of Nevada, born on Halloween. Nevada carries a lot of firsts, per capita murder rates, cancer rates, things that happen here in Nevada that are mm, sort of proof of excess, if you will. That's Nevada. Born on this day, Halloween. What a day to uh, uh, to have joined the Union, wouldn't you say? Yes, uh, Nevada. Nevada's having a birthday today. We're going to break here at the top of the hour, and we will be... Well, I think we will be right back.
is the CBC Radio Network. All right. Uh, once again, all we're doing tonight on any line is taking ghost stories. Real ones. So whatever line you're able to reach us on, this night is devoted to that as it is every year. This is now a yearly event on this program, and I think that I've been doing it probably for a decade. If you would like to join and give us a hair-raising story, you're welcome to. Uh, so once again, we begin. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Happy Halloween, Art. Thank you, and the very same to you, sir. Where are you? Uh, I'm calling you from New Haven, Connecticut. My name is Paul from out of Green Bay, Wisconsin. Very good, Paul. Uh, my, I have two stories for you. One is scary and one is odd. All right, uh, let, let's take the scary one. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, in 1979, I, uh, I had picked up uh, uh, a mask for Halloween, and it was uh, like a, a mask of an old lady, like a hag. Oh, yes. And, uh, well, um, in, the, in the summer of 1980, um, I, I had I was living with my parents, and they had me uh, had a bed set up for me in the basement. I, uh, I was sleeping late one morning, and, uh, I was having this dream that I was being, uh, uh strangled by, like, a witch or a, or a hag. Uh-huh. At least I thought it was a dream. And, uh, it, it was very real. And, uh, it, it was so scary that I, I literally reached up, and I, I, I tried to push this, Whatever it was, off of me. Natural reaction, of course. A natural reaction. It was I was I was fighting for my life. I was starting to go under. Yeah, you bet. And I woke up. I thought, okay, wow, what a nightmare. Uh, I I looked towards the uh, the stairs that led upstairs, and, and right by the foot of the stairs was the rubber mask, laying there. Oh my! Where where? <laughs> there. That's when I got scared. Where had it been? It it, it had been upstairs. Somewhere it, it was not in the basement. It was just laying there, right on the floor. Uh, and I have never been able to, to figure that out. The, the, the only alternative to that is even scarier than, than it, if it had been a ghost or. or well, what like what that. what did you do with the rubber mask? I don't know. It disappeared. It I disappeared. I told my family oh, about it, that's and very bad. they didn't believe me. You know, I was a you know teenager, and they probably figured I just had a dream. Do you have any marks on you? Uh, no. That, I did not have any marks on me. Uh, it, was well, very, it was very strange because we had relatives from California over that hadn't uh, been visited for years and years. And uh, when I went upstairs, they were up there uh, talking away, and it was just the whole thing was just weird. All right. Well, we'll leave it for the audience to decide from New Haven, Connecticut. Do you think that uh, there could be something in a mask? In a thing. I think things uh, can be possessed, can't they? Mr. Bell, I'm an avid listener to your program. It helps me pass the time on slow nights working the streets here in the Denver metro area. The following incident actually occurred and was documented in official police records with my agency. The names and locations have been changed to protect the privacy of those involved. On October 29th, 1993, at 14.30 hours, 2.30 for the non-military, I was dispatched to the scene of a hysterical woman in a court facility under my jurisdiction. Upon my arrival, I found a 42-year-old uh, Hispanic female in tears and extreme emotional distress. The individual was employed as a janitor, had been cleaning a courtroom on the fifth floor, and had just witnessed something that frightened her terribly. I was able to calm the woman and proceeded to ask her what had happened. She described working in the courtroom after a daily session when she felt a chill surround her. She glanced to her left when she perceived someone standing near the doors to the courtroom. As she turned toward the person, the person dissolved and was gone. It was then when the victim became, became agitated and ran from the courtroom. The apparition was described as a white female with long, black hair to her waist, and wearing an archaic red dress. I was somewhat amused by the incident. Didn't quite believe the lady, that someone may have been playing a Halloween joke on her. At her insistence, I examined the area and found nothing out of the ordinary. I did feel this would be a great Halloween report for the record, so I decided to go ahead and file a report. 
As I was leaving the building, I was dispatched on another call to meet a detective in the same building. So I met with a detective in his office, and he reported to me that he had witnessed a strange circumstance in the basement near the elevators. He was somewhat reluctant to tell me all the story, but I was finally able to make sense of what he was trying to say. Apparently, the detective was walking toward the elevators, remember, folks, same building, when he observed, you've got it, a white female with long black hair wearing a red dress standing at the elevator doors. As they opened, the woman stepped inside. The detective called for her to hold the door for him. She did not. It closed just as he got there. The detective then pushed the call button for the elevator. The doors immediately opened, and nobody was there. The detective stated the elevator had not moved. There was no sign of the woman or any way she could have exited the elevator within the time allowed, knowing that police officers are often given to pulling pranks on one another. I suspected I might be getting set up. But I went ahead and added the detective's statement to that report. When I returned to the station for end of shift, I showed the report to a fellow officer who studied this kind of thing. She was very interested, and I was surprised at her behavior. She called a friend of hers. We all went back to the courthouse and entered the courtroom. It was now midnight on the dot when we sat in the room in question. My friend sat on one side of the room, I on the other, supposedly to keep from interfering with their procedure. I was very unaware at this point what to expect. I still thought I was getting set up. All of a sudden, the temperature in the room dropped drastically. I felt a tingling on my skin. I looked at my partner and her friend, and they seemed to be in a trance-like state. I was getting a little frightened when they said, She's here. And I left the courtroom by the nearest door available. I didn't know if there really was something there, but I was of the mind to wait outside the room. Suddenly, my partner and her friend opened the door to the courtroom and asked me back inside. After some considerable argument, I returned with them. Never saw anything, but I felt a presence near me, and I asked my partner what the thing wanted. I was told the spirit wanted to tell or ask me something. At this point, I really was frightened. So I asked, what does it want? I was told by my partner's friend that the spirit wanted to know if it was all right to leave. I looked at my partner, and she nodded to me. And so I told the spirit she could leave, and everything was all right. As suddenly as it appeared, the cold, the feeling of presence, disappeared. I was completely in awe. My partner later told me that the spirit was looking for someone to tell it was okay to leave this world and go on. I'm not sure what really happened, but I do know there was something there, and that I will never again scoff at the fears or perceptions of another human being. That is a Denver police officer whose name I will withhold. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello, Ward. Hello, sir. This is Curtis from Rockford, Illinois. Yes, sir. Sure am enjoying these ghost stories tonight. Well, they're interesting, aren't they? Yes, they are. Uh, I had an experience back in the mid-'70s in a house my uh, new wife and I had moved into. Uh, she worked days and I worked nights, so we weren't there at the same time very often. Uh, but we both started noticing things uh, when we were there by ourselves where there were would be a vibrating noise. Uh -huh. uh, we could never quite pinpoint it down. Uh, didn't seem to last long enough to pinpoint it. Uh, finally, one day, I was there by myself in uh, mid-morning, heard the vibrating, and started walking around the house trying to pinpoint it. And it happened to be a vase sitting on a table. And uh, uh, I touched it, could feel it vibrating, and as soon as I touched it, it quit. Didn't think much more about it. Uh, a few days later, the sound started again, mm -hmm. uh, tracked it down to a large mirror we had on the wall. And for some reason or other, I had a real strange feeling as far as I wasn't sure if I wanted to touch the mirror or not. Right. Uh, the vibration, it would uh, raise in tone and then lower and then raise and lower. Uh, it stayed real steady. Finally, I did put 
put my hand on the mirror and, and felt the vibration, uh, which did stop the vibration and the sound. Huh. And it was kind of disquieting, you know. I uh, told my wife about it. And she said, yeah, she'd been hearing it too here and there from time to time. Uh, about a week later, uh, mid-morning again, I'm doing dishes, looking out the back window. And, uh, I've got one sink piled with dishes to rinse. And I had a piece of glass taken out of the uh, door of the toaster oven and we had it all washed up and set it over on top of the other dishes. And uh, I was starting to get into the silverware section of it when this vibration started again. Huh. It was real soft this time. Walked around the house trying to find out where it was coming from this time. And sure. Couldn't quite find it. Went back to the dishes, and all the time still hearing the vibration real soft and low. Well, now it starts to almost throb, uh, getting higher and lower and louder and louder. Yes. And all of a sudden, it, I just realized that the noise is coming from uh, the sink right in front of me where I'm putting these wash dishes to be rinsed. And I'm just kind of looking down at the sink, and it was as if a hammer was just with all of somebody or something's might hit the bottom of this piece of glass out of the toaster oven, and it exploded straight up into my face. Oh, my God. Uh, there, there wasn't another dish moved. Uh, nothing else broke. Were you cut? Yes, I did get a little cut on my cheek from flying glass. And the, what really surprised me was that uh, the kitchen is right off the living room, but there was even glass got into the living room. The, the force of the explosion was so great. Uh, I had to sit down for a while. That uh, really unnerved me. That'll put you on your knees. Yes, it will. <laughs> That'll put you on your knees. There's no question about it. And... Uh, after I collected myself a little bit, I went back and looked around the kitchen again, and uh, nothing else was disturbed. Uh, I cleaned up the mess, uh, told my wife about it, and you know she didn't know what to make of it. And uh, the cut on my cheek seemed to take forever to heal, uh, like it was close to a month. Now, I've cut myself shaving before, and it never took that long to heal, you know? Right. Uh, what do you uh, think? What do you think happened? Do you have any idea? Well, my own personal personal thought is that there was a spirit uh, that did this uh, for some reason or other was upset with us being at that house. Yeah, it sounds that way. That sounds like typical poltergeist activity, but it's a little malevolent uh, uh, for a poltergeist. Normally, uh, they do small, insignificant little things, and that sounded pretty scary. Well, the interesting thing is that after it drew blood, it never happened again. Maybe that's what it wanted. If that's what it wanted, it surely did get it. Thank you, my friend. You're welcome. Take care. Uh, for those of you who heard last hour, there was um, a particularly interesting story told by a lady in San Antonio about some haunted railroad tracks where to this day, if you drive near them, well, uh, to, to catch you up, there were some children in a school bus that were killed by a train on the tracks. And the story goes that since that time, and this lady experienced it herself, if you drive near the tracks and stop your vehicle, your vehicle will begin to move automatically and will be, in effect, pushed across the tracks. And people have been putting baby powder on the back of their cars and finding children's handprints in the baby powder. And I just, after hearing that story, I just got this fax. Hey, Art, you know about the school bus story where the children push the cars over the tracks? It's true. It was, one of our, uh, it was on one of our local news stories today. They had video showing the car moving on its own, and they had video of the fingerprints Steve from Southern California. Thought you should hear that. Wildcard Line, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, this is Ron from Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Hello, Ron. I called about a week ago about my New Guinea singing dog, and tonight I have a story about my daughter. All right. Okay, when she was 
about four years old, we moved to the Kansas City area and bought an old two-story house there. And shortly after moving in, the neighbor's house was broken into, and the police later came and asked if we had heard or seen anything. Mm-hmm. After they left, my daughter uh, said, Daddy, my friend Daggett said he would never let bad people in our house. Hmm. And I asked her who Daggett was. Yes. You know, I uh, am from California originally. I know there's a Daggett, California. Yes, there is. And uh, she had never been to California at that time, and I don't know where she came up with that name. So anyway, I asked her, Who's Daggett? Who, who's Daggett? Yep. She said that he lived in the house, and he'd been there for a long time. Well, my wife and I just wrote that off, you know, childhood imagination. Imaginary playmate. Right. Uh, well, anyway, we lived there about four years, and we constantly heard things, uh, especially in the basement. Uh, our washer and dryer were in the basement, and it got to where my wife wouldn't go down into the basement unless I was in the house, and then at night she wouldn't even go down at all unless I went with her. So I, I don't just blame got her. to where I did the laundry. You know, right. It may have been a trick on her part. Of. A trick? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my daughter would occasionally run to the basement stairs uh, and yell, Be quiet, Daggett, and the noise would stop. Well, anyway, uh, uh-huh. this was, like I say, just written off as, uh, you know, an old house that creaked in a child's imagination. Sure. But one night, uh, I went into her bedroom to read her bedtime story, and we had a large overstuffed uh, chair sitting next to her bed, uh-huh. and I sat down in the chair, and it was like I had walked into a meat locker. I mean, it was so cold that it took cold. my breath away. Uh-huh. And my daughter screamed, Daddy, get off of Daggett. Oh, my. And from uh, that point on... How, uh, sir, how old is your daughter now? Well, I'm, like Paul Harvey says, uh, this is the rest of the story. All right. My daughter is a freshman at a university here in Oklahoma that I won't give you the name of or the identifier, but anyway, she is president of the university's pagan society. So <laughs> she's a witch. <laughs> she is a member, or, or whatever you call it, of the uh, group called Wicca. Ah, uh, yes, those are witches. So she uh, is all excited right now. She just called me about an hour ago. You know, the big goings on. You know, that they're having big overnight bonfire and. Oh, I'm sure it's a big day. I don't. Uh, it's a big day. I don't even ask questions about what's going on. Do you ask? <laughs> do you ask <laughs> I do about? No, I understand. Do you, do you ask about Daggett ever? Well, that was funny. I asked her tonight, and... Well, listen, we're not going to have time. I'm, I'm at a break point. That's a hell of a story, though, sir, and I appreciate it. Daggett in the chair. No, thank you. When my eyes beheld an eerie sight For my monster from his slab began to rise And suddenly, to my surprise He did the match He did the monster match The monster match We'll be right back, I think. All right, back to the lines we go. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Good morning, Mr. Bell. Good morning. Well, this story goes back about 15 years ago up in Washington State. All right, are you in Washington? No, no, I'm right here in Pahrump, Nevada. Oh, you're in Pahrump? Yep. Excellent. I'm your neighbor. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, I was living in a real nice cabin up above a lake. It was an old cabin built in the early 1900s. And I'm a jeweler by trade, and I do a lot of work late at night. I'm a, I'm a late night hawker. I kept feeling something over my shoulder, uh-huh. and my wife would be up in bed. One night, I turned around real quick, and I said, damn it, leave me alone. Hmm. And nothing happened. And I didn't feel it anymore. Well, I talked to my wife about it, and I have had encounters before. I said, you know, this thing ain't going to hurt me, or I would have done it. So that night, late, late, and I'm working away, and I said, hey, listen, whatever, whoever you are, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. Come back. Hmm. About an hour later, I feel something over my shoulder. Yes. Kiddingly, I started nicknaming him Henry. Yes. Uh, a week, two weeks goes by. 
and my wife's sitting there, and I say something about Henry, and a voice comes up, and it says, my name's not Henry, it's Harry. Harry. We're... I'm glad this didn't happen in Peru. Yeah, but it, it, it was really crazy. I mean, we all went wacko, of course. Um, time goes by, and we start communicating. Wait, wait, wait. Slow up. Yeah. Uh, he said his name was Harry. He said his name was Harry. Now, was this out loud? No. Was no. The, we, you, you heard this in your mind? Exactly. But it's together. We both hear this. That's bad. And I'm I'm speaking out loud to him. Yes. Um, and he's answering in your head. Yeah. And and your wife. Your exactly. Wife's great. So I'm talking away. And I actually through through time. This is over. This is over weeks, maybe even a couple months. And I feel him every night on my shoulder, watching me. One night he says to me, "Tell your wife I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare her. I will not do it again." Okay. The next day, uh, of course, I wake up late. The next day, she says, "Your buddy visited me last night and scared the hell out of me." <laughs> and I says, what are you talking about? Yes. She says, Henry was looking over me in my bed. And she says, I hollered at him and told him to get out of my room and never to come back again. I got the wickedest feeling. I looked at her and I says, that's what he meant. She says, what? I says, he told me to tell you he was sorry and it would never happen again. Yeah. Now, through time, I, I tried to communicate with him and find out. I did not do any research on it, Art. I, I was, I guess, scared to find out what I might find out. Sure. Is that when he disappeared? He never did. We, we moved out of the place, but he communicated with us until the time we moved. And he told me he was killed in a fire in the home. I said, well, where was this fire supposed to be? And you, so, never, you never researched it? Well, I found where the fire was. You did? I found where the fire was. He told me where the fire had been and how I could find boards. And I went to the far end of the house. Mm -hmm. this, this room was, the front room was very, very big. It was very beautiful. Uh, now, like I say, this was an old house, but it was still beautiful. And it had been redone. I went to the far end of the, to the room where the stairs start going upstairs. Yes. I removed a board, and there was burnt, charcoal lumber underneath it oh man and that's really all there is to it he never he never meant to hurt anybody that's he was enough very, he was neat well your idea of neat i very much appreciate your call sir but i don't know that that's my idea of neat that's more than a coincidence i i guess i guess if it happened to you and it didn't come to you in a frightening form it would be his word, neat. But I think I would have to experience that that calm and that uh, a lack of concern and worry personally before I would regard it as neat. Burning is not a good way to go. This is the CBC Radio Network. Wildcard Line, you're on the air. Hello. Happy Halloween, Art. And to you, sir. About... 1982, I had just remarried, and I was working a swing shift, and the guy, we were, I think it was Halloween, we were sitting around talking, and a guy was telling me that his son was putting up psychedelic posters in his bedroom, yes. and something kept tearing them off the walls, and I asked him where he lived, and found out that he was kind of in, close to where I lived, and my buddy and I and our wives went out one night, summer night, eight months later, and took a Ouija board mm. in the back of my pickup truck, and we parked in a deserted canyon, a box canyon adjacent to this housing track where this man lived. And my wife and I started playing with the Ouija board, and it, it has never worked for me, so I couldn't get anything. Well, then Conrad, my friend, and one of the girls tried it, and nothing happened. And then the two girls tried it, and they started asking questions and started getting answers that there was a spirit there. Mm -hmm. And my friend Conrad is making notes on a pad of paper. And I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, I got this real weird feeling come over me. And we had some uh, folding chairs, and I picked up a folding chair and went over to the edge of a, like a ravine and just sat down and had this calm. And then the next thing I know, my buddy Conrad is shaking me. He says, Dick, are you okay? Are you okay? 
And I said, what happened? And he says, listen to this. If he'd come over with a tape recorder, and I had been sitting there chanting some really weird stuff, and he had it on the tape recorder. Oh, and he says, what is this? And I says, I don't know. I says, I don't know where it came from. Well, then Conrad got a weird feeling. We went back to the truck. The girls were sitting there kind of shook up. And then Conrad went and sat in that chair, and he had the paper still in his hand, and he started writing. And he wrote three pages of what would look like, at the time I thought, like maybe kind of Chinese. And then uh, later I found out it looks like what the uh, Lakota Sioux writing used to look like. And we we don't know what it was going on. We, we, we knew there was a spirit there or something. And I said, you know, let's get out of here. And so we started picking up our stuff and putting it in the truck. And Conrad's wife, who was uh, slight in stature, all of a sudden jumped out of the truck and was standing there like she was a man. Big, uh, her arms flexed out to her side, and her voice came out in this low voice, and she started talking to us in English. And I don't remember everything that she said because we talked to this spirit that was coming through Barbara for a long time. But basically what we found out was there was a hunting party of Indians up in this Box Canyon. Yes. They got ambushed, and by like a rival uh, Indian tribe, Yes. and they didn't bury them. And their spirits were lost in this Box Canyon, and they haunted the housing track when it was encroaching on their area. And Conrad, my friend, told them that it was time for them to go home and that they should take and cross over, and that he would guide them. He says uh, Conrad had like a, a spirit guide for, uh, for himself. Yes. He says, this person, uh, Amy, will help you cross over, and everything is okay. And he sent them home. And then uh, about a month later, I talked to the guy at work. He says, you know, he says, I was telling you about all that problems I was having in my kid's room. He says, we haven't had any more problems. So we solved this problem by getting rid of the spirits that were lost there and never buried. You did a good thing. I don't know that I could have gone that far with it. Please give me your fax number. It's area code 702-727-8499. Yes. 8499. Yep. Do you have a blue picture of Charlton Heston or David Canary in your house? No comment, sir. I appreciate the call. Well, uh, I don't know that I would have lasted that long. Uh, that is, that's possession. Automatic writing. Uh, speaking uh, in, in tongues. And then finally, uh, serious possession. And I think before then, I would have been gone. Hi, Art. I've got a true story for you and your listeners. When I was in high school, I met this nice family from overseas who bought a home in our neighborhood. As time went by, they became my friends. Subsequently, they offered to let me actually stay with them rent-free if I would help them fix up another home. I thought it would be fun, and with the approval of my parents, I did that. What followed was sometimes wonderful, and at other times, a truly awful horror. I believe I was somehow warned to leave by a force that bothered everyone but me. I felt protected by something. And I think it may have been my deceased brother who passed a few years earlier. As I tried to tell members of the family the things I saw, I was met with deaf ears. Finally, one night, I talked to one member of the family into playing some Scrabble with me. When we finished playing Scrabble, I left the board on the floor, and the tiles just muscled about on top. I awoke to find the Scrabble board with words so ugly I can't even say them, let alone tell them to you. Needless to say, cuss words. When I called up a member of the family to see, they just shrugged their shoulders. As they were walking out of the room, my stereo went crazy. The channels began changing wildly. The family members seemed to be oblivious to this. I moved. Later, I found out there were some real abuses going on. That the man was sent out of the Philippines for abuses he committed against his first wife and children. Thus he moved to the U.S., and I believe that is why there was such evil in that house. That's from Anne in New Mexico. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Morning, Art. Morning. And happy uh, St. Hallow's Eve. Yeah, so it is. Uh, got, a, got a wild one for you. All right. 
uh, family recently came into money some time ago, and we bought an old house. And uh, we're restoring it, and we started our. My wife started a, a antique store. And after a while, we got you know getting a nice collection going. We noticed uh, strange things happening. Some of the antiques that we would get would end up on the floor or across the room. But the strange thing was, these were children's toys, mostly dolls. Really. And this went on for a while, and then they were moving by themselves. Well, we, you know, we'd lock up at the end of the night. In the morning, when we come down, that's where they'd be. Okay. I'm no longer in, in the place on the shelf. So, what did you presume that you were being broken into or something? Well, we were, we really weren't sure what was going on. You know, we thought maybe we had mice or something. And then uh, my aunt, who does a lot of these, who's into a lot of this, you know, I thought maybe, well, maybe there's something to it. It was all harmless. And then uh, we started hearing. A uh, child cry late at night. We oh. thought it was our daughter. Uh huh. We'd go running into our her room, and there she is, you know, sound asleep. Uh huh. And then later on, after that, some of the toys in her room was being tossed around or misplaced. Uh huh. And this started getting a little creepy. You know, we uh, moved into a to a friend's house for a while, and you know, we'd check in on the shop every morning and. Same thing, you know, daughter's room, what was left was still being tossed around. And no one was getting hurt, no one, you know, was, nothing was happening to anyone, so, you know, it was nice and safe. And then after a while, after we'd uh, start, you know, going on with the renovation, we knocked out an old wall, and uh, they, the repairman said, hey, you're collecting antiques, here's one for you. It was a very, very, very old doll that was blackened well, like it was in a fire. And that area behind the wall also looked like it had been in a fire. And so uh, my wife, she's really good about restoring things. You know, she cleaned it up, put in some new eyes, uh, new clothing, and yes. actually set on the shelf. And nothing really happened after that. Everything had calmed down. Maybe you had found the center of it and, and you cured it somehow. Well, that's, so that's we, an incredible story. Well, it hadn't dawned on us until we had sold this particular item, and everything started up again. Oh. And so we have been trying to track down this doll to get it back. Oh, now, time. wait a minute. Uh, so in other words, uh, you sold that doll right. as an antique. Right. And the hauntings began again. Right. And now, you're trying, to, now you're trying to get the doll back? Yes. We're desperately trying to find the person we sold it to. Did some research on the house. Uh, it really is an old building. It was one of the earlier ones in Kansas City, and it used to be a private orphanage that had burned down. <sighs> um, I wish you luck. <laughs> Short of being able to get that doll back, I think it's time to go on to whatever is next. Sounds like a good plan. Thanks, Thanks for the call. Uh, well, there's a story for you. Yikes. I thought it was over, but he sold the doll, and now it has returned. Whatever it is, it wants that doll back, and I suspect if it doesn't get it... Well, as I said, sir, there have got to be other things for you to do. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Yeah, this is, I've got a real weird story for you. All right, where are you? In Mount Lake Terrace, All right. north of Seattle. Yes, sir? Uh, a long time ago, when I was about 11 years old, one of my mom's friend's son was killed on Halloween. And... Then a couple months go on from that, then all of a sudden my mom gets connected with this one lady that plays with Ouija boards. And uh -huh. she said, oh, this, can I ask a question? Uh -huh. And the woman said, sure, go right ahead. And she said, would I ever lose my sons? Well, the thing pointed to yes. And my mom said, ah, that's nothing. Then about a year from that, me and my brother end up in a foster home. We end up in my mom's friends, that son that died on Halloween, her foster home, and I get his bedroom. Wow. And all of a sudden, I was asleep one night, and there was like two other foster kids in the bedroom with me. Yes. And I'm asleep on my bed, and they're asleep in their bed. All of a sudden, I feel my bed pressed down real hard, like someone's sitting on it. And I got scared. I didn't even want to open up my eyes. And I said, get out of here in the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden, the bed just, boom, raised up. 
raised up? Well, it, you know, from the push and... Oh, you mean from being depressed, yeah. it raised up. So whatever it was, left immediately. Yep, and I went to the foster mother, and she said, Oh, it was the dog. He's in your room. I said, No, he wasn't. The door was closed. You're sure of that? Yeah, I, I was positive of that. And I asked everyone else in the bedroom, after they woke up, Did you feel anything? They looked at me. They said, You're crazy. Well, it's a good story, and I appreciate your telling it. All right. Thank you. That, uh, that to me, uh, seems like it was a story of just evil. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Uh, how you doing, Art? This uh, is Bill from uh, St. Louis. Yes, sir. Um, I experienced something one time when I was in the Marines in uh, Okinawa, Japan. I know Okinawa. I live there. I had a Japanese girlfriend, mm -hmm. and uh, we were visiting the southern area where uh, they have all these monuments of the of World War Two. Oh yes. <clears throat> and one time we were there watching the sun go down, you know, along the horizon. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. And uh, we 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 felt the presence of people all all around us and we we could hear hear voices in our head like um you know people talking which I couldn't understand it and I looked to my uh you know Japanese girlfriend yes and she was running a mile a minute uh-huh you know back to the car and she she had tears rolling out of her eyes and she never never told me what what she heard or seen or I felt you would never talk about it. Mm -hmm. And that's probably something I, I never forgot since I was on that island. Well, I, too, lived there many years, sir, at uh, Kadena first, Kadena Air Force Base, then Naha. And I can tell you, there were many bloody battles on that island. Many people died of uh, very violent deaths on that island. That's Okinawa. And it's a haunted island. We will be back. Calls on the wild card line at 702 727 1295. That's 702 727 1295. First time callers can reach Art Bell at 702 727 1222. 702 727 1222. Now, here again, Art Bell. Ghost to ghost. It's the real thing, and that's why it's scary. How can you listen to all of this and not believe? Hmm? Or perhaps you're beginning to change your opinion as the evening goes on. I'm Art Bell, and we'll get back to our stories from you. Nothing you want to meet in the woods late at night, believe me. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from Essex Junction, Vermont. Essex Junction, Vermont. All right. Welcome to the program. Uh, my uh, story was uh, really creepy because I never believed in it. Uh, mm -hmm. My best friend and I uh, got to be uh, real close when we were growing up. And uh, this happened in Connecticut. And uh, his father was killed. And... Um, after that, it was uh, probably two or three months after that, he told me one day that he thought that somebody was uh, watching him, that he would see uh, a man uh, like across the street, or if he was in a store, he could see a man uh, outside uh, on the street, uh, across the street, watching him. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I said, well, you're, you're out of your mind, or have you ever told anybody, you know, call the cops or anything? And he said, no. 
He was a pretty conservative uh, kid. We were about 17 at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, one day, uh, and this this kept happening more frequently. It wouldn't happen just once a month. Sometimes it was happening two, three times a month, and sometimes it was happening once a week. And uh, one day I went over to his house, and uh, he was, I walked through the, the door and uh, went into the kitchen, and he was sitting at the kitchen table talking to a guy. Mm. And I just, I just saw this guy for, for an instant. And my friend looked at me, and when we both looked to where this guy was sitting, he wasn't sitting there anymore. Just gone. Just, I didn't see him disappear. He couldn't have left. I was standing in the doorway, <laughs> and it was just very, very strange. We got, you know, a real cold chill. And I asked him what he was talking about, and he said that they were talking about things that this guy had done in his life. And I said, well, where did he come from? And he said he was just in the house. You know, you're the second call like that tonight. There was a lady who called uh, also about a young boy who just appeared and talked with her. And she didn't think anything that strange of it uh, at, at the time, which surprised me. And this sounds just like that. Well, it, I'll tell you, it sure scared me because I didn't mm-hmm. see this. And, I mean, this was a real guy. I mean, he was there. And then well, something. Was neither something. one of us saw him disappear. It wasn't, you know, a, yes. a, a foggy image or anything. It was... I, I understand. Some, something was there. there, sir. Something was there. Thank you very much for the call. Vermont is kind of a, uh, you know, all of New England, for that matter, is a little bit older goes back to the beginning of our country, and uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of history, let me put it that way. Thank you very much. Thank you. You take care. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Art. This is Johnny from Hawaii Kai. Uh, in Hawaii, yes. Yes, I wanted to share a true story that happened to our family in 1971. We just recently moved from Los Angeles to Escondido, California. Oh, yes. And my dad was working the night shift. He was a deputy sheriff in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And we'd been in this house about a week now. And uh, I had fallen, it was the middle of the summer, I had fallen asleep in the living room watching TV. And I would say about somewhere around 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, something came by me and whisked by my shoulder and kind of woke me up out of a dead sleep. And when I lifted the covers off my head to see what was there, there was nothing nothing there at all. Huh. But whatever was next to me or what had woken me up had scared me so bad to the point that I was, I was like, um, paralyzed. I, I couldn't move at all. And all I could think of was trying to get back. I was 11 years old at the time, trying to get back to where... My mom's bedroom was at the time. I couldn't move at all. I was just frightened. I felt an eerie presence around me. Mm-hmm. And within about five minutes of me being woken up, the light in my mom's bedroom had went on, and my brother Jerry was in sleeping with my mom back back in the back bedroom because right. my dad was at work. Anyways, the light went on. As soon as that light went on, our, I ran as fast as I could from the living room all the way to the back of the house to where my mom was, and something had woke her up as well. And I told her, well, I'm going to let the dog in because there's something in the house. Good move. As soon as we opened up that back door and let our German shepherd come in, the dog just started barking like crazy. It just was going down the hall. Whatever was in the house, whatever spirit or whatever it was, the dog was actually backing the spirit away to keep the keep the spirit away from us. In I other believe words. that animals can sense them. Right. And I'll tell you what, none of us the rest of that night got any sleep whatsoever. <laughs> and within, I think, the next day or so, I don't remember exactly how many days it was, but I'm pretty sure it was like the next day when my dad had got home, we called the priest and had a priest come over and bless the house and everything. And ever since that time, we've never felt... Uh, 
you know, never had any problems with it. At well, all. It, it works, and uh, thank you. Uh, things do haunt places. There is no question about it. Personally, I never liked closets. I still don't. When I was young, well, I, I really don't want to relate all of the stories. Suffice it to say that as an adult, I don't go to sleep with open closets. I close them. <laughs> I'd really rather not relate the experience that has me doing this, but uh, I close closets. Uh, I will absolutely, even if I'm on the edge of sleep and I detect there is an open closet, I will, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, go and close it first. Get up and go close it. First time caller line, you're on the air. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Hi, yes, this is Heather in San Clemente. Hi, Heather. Hi. Uh, and this is a story that happened um, when I was about 14, 15 years old. Right. And I was living in Ohio and in an old farmhouse. And we had tons of little ghost stories, but this is the one that really got me. Because my, uh, my girlfriend and I, we, I got a Ouija board for Christmas, and we were playing with it and everything. Yeah. Young teenage girls and Ouija boards. Yeah, I know. Those, this goes back to your teenage girl thing. Yes, it does. And, um, well, the Ouija board kind of led on because we were also looking into Supernatural, and, and looking into that, we found out about channeling. Mm -hmm. And it led on that my friend could channel spirits. Yes. So she, we started doing this where we used the Ouija board sort of like a conduit. Yes. So she started channeling spirits, and we're doing this, and then after a couple of weeks, I kind of got bored, and I'm like, well, I want to do it. So I decided to do it, and uh, and I remember the experience of having it start where I'm still there. I have my eyes closed, I know, but I can see the room, um, and I can also feel the presence in my body of this other spirit. And I was, it was a freaky thing, you know, but it was going all right. Where I, I hear the talking going on between myself and her. Yes. And uh, then I hear complaining about how bright it is in the room. Did you hear it uh, in a detached way? Yes, uh, yes. yes. I was words. kind of separated from my body. Cause I, I, am. I could see the room, even though physically my eyes were closed. Right. I could see around the room. And so then you began to sense light? Yes, the, the light was too bright. We had a candle, you know, prerequisite for the of Ouija board. <laughs> yes. We had a candle, and, and the, the light seemed so bright, even to me, myself, and the spirit was complaining about it being so bright, asking her to blow it out. And then she did. And as, as that happened, I look over to the side of the room, and I see my father standing there, who died when I was two years old. Mm. So I go over to give my father a hug because, you know, I've never even actually known him. Yes. And I go to give him a hug, and as soon as I do, he disappears. And m my vision, from what I'm seeing, goes completely black, and I start seeing uh, serpents with two heads, red eyes, rats. Everything is black with red eyes. It's horrible. And then uh, the next thing that I come to realize is, the lights are on, and she's just panicked. She's like, mm -hmm. yeah, and I run to the bathroom because I can't even breathe. My heart hurts. My chest hurts. I, I have this burning sensation in my whole body. Yep. I, I can't even get a breath. How old are you now? I'm uh, 25 now, 24 25, now. 24. Yeah. 24. Look, um, what you did was very dangerous. Oh, I know that. Now, I mean, after that, we never did anything like that again. Well, there are probably a lot of teenage girls sitting up listening tonight. And when I had Brad Steiger on the other night, he said, you know, you can tell them, but they're not going to listen. They're going to do it anyway. Oh, it is. It is. It's, it's bad. You don't mess around with that stuff. You, know? you don't mess around with that. And I'm not surprised. I really thank you for that story. And I'm, I'm sure that you never touched it again. Yeah, not, especially not in that way. <laughs> I appreciate it, dear. All right. Thank you. Teenage girls and Ouija boards. It's really a volatile combination. Wildcard Line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Hi. It's great to talk to you. This is Mike from Long Beach. Hi, Mike. Um, this is a story that, uh, that happened uh, in a place called Claxton, Georgia. Claxton, not, Georgia. Not too far from Savannah. All right where my father's family is from. And uh, I was down there visiting one time, and uh, I went to see a cousin. And uh, 
Actually, I had another cousin along with me, mm-hmm. and uh, my girlfriend at the time. I'm a little nervous, Art. I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. Just tell the story. Okay. <laughs> uh, my cousin said, uh, have you ever seen a ghost before? Mm-hmm. And I said, no. And he said, would you like to see one? Well, I said, I sure uh, would. Oh, really? And my girlfriend, oh, really? Yeah, my girlfriend was into the Stephen King novels and Anne Rice, uh-huh. and she was she was ready to go, too. So he said, we need to go to this place uh, in the woods. Mm. And Yeah, yeah, so we decided to go, and there was a little bridge there. You're like the you're like the woman in the low cut dress that goes right to the basement. I mean, you went out to the woods. We went out to the woods. All right. He said he assured us that he had been several times, and he had taken friends. Yeah. He said everyone around Claxton knew about this story mm. of a uh, of a couple, a black couple, who had been uh, overcome by a white mob, and uh, the husband had been lynched. And he said, if we go to this bridge that was near the site of the lynching, yes. um, and we, here, here's the tricky part, Art. We had, to, we had to walk across the bridge with our heads down as, as though uh, we had been lynched. And we walked across the bridge all the way across, and then we walked back to the center. And we looked up, and across the road... Uh, it was a little hill and a lot of trees, and uh, we just waited. And all at the same time, we said, I see it. We saw her come out of the woods. Her? Her. We saw her. She was looking for the spirit of her husband. Uh-huh. And, um... Oh, man. It, oh, man, is right. I mean, that's, to me, that's going too far to have a truly frightening experience. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't very frightened. No? Um, no, actually, I was more. I was curious. My girlfriend was running away. That um, would have been me. <laughs> that would have been. That's that would right. have been you. But yeah, I right. was. I was very curious, and she seemed to be moving in slow motion, coming down the hill towards us, yes. darting back into the trees, yes. and then coming down a little bit further and reappearing. Mm-hmm. And uh, although her shape was sort of, it, she looked torn and tattered, but she was uh, like a green glow. Uh huh. And. Um, and you just uh, you just stood, stood there we watching, stood there. saying, "Cool." We stood we stood there. Uh, my one of my cousins left, who hadn't seen it before. He ran smart away. Smart cousin, yeah. <laughs> the smart cousin. And my girlfriend was running too. Mm-hmm, smart and, uh, girlfriend. Another cousin of mine and I stayed, and. Uh, Dumb cousins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I I didn't feel frightened. Yeah, and so you stayed, and what happened? Well, e- eventually we left because the others were were running back. To my cousin's truck, and we didn't want to be left behind, uh-huh. so so we followed them. But uh, but nothing uh, bad ever came of it. Um, if I ever go back to the, to, to Claxton, Georgia again, I'll, I'll be out on that bridge. You again. would do that again. I would do that again. Hmm. Well, maybe it's an IQ problem, basic, you know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for the call. Oh, thank you, Art. Right, take care. I I <laughs> oh my gosh, that's going too far. To have too much of a terrifying experience. <laughs> West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Yeah, hi, Art. This is Lance from Clam Falls, Oregon. Hi, Lance. Yeah, hi. Uh, I got a story I want to tell you when uh, I just got out of the Marine Corps and I lived in Southern California. Uh, a friend of mine was getting married and uh, his wife was from Hanford, California. Uh huh. And we had to go over there for the wedding. And uh, before we went over there, she said that we had to, you know, we could stay at a friend of her house where she lived uh, when she was a teenager. Uh, But she warned us about this one room in this house that was built on by the guy that used to own the house Uh that she used to stay in. And she said that she woke up one night and there was this thunder and lightning going on in the house. And uh, she got really scared and she got up and she looked outside and all she saw was a starry sky. So No uh, no clouds? No uh, storm? No clouds, no nothing. Thunder and, and lightning inside the house? Uh, yeah, she saw the okay. flash going through the windows. And so we kind of took this story like, uh, ho hum. Yeah, right. Sir. And yeah, and so me and uh, 
my friend was in the back room there where she used to stay, and they had like a couch back there and kind of like a game room with a dart board. Right. And we're uh, standing there throwing darts, and uh, we're talking about, yeah, what do you think? Jenny, uh, you think she's uh, uh, had a little too much to drink or something during that night when she saw these uh, clouds and this thunderstorm and stuff? And, yes. And, uh, you know, we're kind of discussing it. And, uh, we just got through throwing darts, uh, all six of them, in the dart board. My friend uh, went to pull one dart out, and it popped out of the dart board. And he goes, oh, no. And then, you know, like he didn't get the points or something for the darts. And then he went to pull another dart out, and it fell down to the ground. You mean before he pulled it? Yeah, before he even touched it. He oh. went to reach for it, and okay. this happened all three times. All right. So... After that, we stood back, and we looked at my three darts, and each one of them, one by one, fell down to the ground. And we just went, oh, right, whoa. Oh, whatever. Yeah, yes. so we went in, we ran, and we told everybody, and they said a, a weird thing also happened in that house, where they had their speaker set up in this house, and they're sitting there listening to the stereo, and all the speaker wires started flying off the wall, and unplug the speakers. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. Very bad. That's yeah. even worse than the darts. Yeah, well, the wedding ended up just as, well, the wedding ended up pretty good, but the marriage didn't turn out too good. The marriage? <laughs> 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 but anyway, uh, oh, you know what you ought, oh, I wanted to tell you. You know what you ought to do tonight? What's that? Your cat sound. You gotta oh, do the cat sound. Well, maybe I'll try and fit it in. But... You gotta. It's Halloween. All right. All right, nice talking to you, Art. And to you, sir. Have a good one. We'll uh, be right back. CBC. If you have the guts, turn your lights out. I have. And by the way, I want to thank my wife for decorating my studio with all kinds of nifty things. As a matter of fact, there is a skull. Uh, she's hung crepe, as she always does for me. There's a skull right above me, and if I clap my hands, it chatters its teeth, and it... It lights up and it sounds horrible. And then there's a little guy from one of the uh, one of the horrible TV shows that's here. And then I've got a little thing and I can push buttons on this little thing and I get weird sounds of all kinds. Well, I'm telling you, she has done it up for me. So you see, I'm in the mood here, and how much you want to get in the mood is dependent on well, the guts you have, the body parts you have. How far you're willing to turn down the lights. The only thing I won't do is open the closet. East of the Rockies, you are on the air. Top of the morning to you. Uh, well, when I was 12 years old... Where, where are you, sir? Pennsylvania. All right. Uh, when I was 12 years old, a uh, real close friend of the family died. And she came to me and gave me a dollar bill. Uh -huh. And she said that she'd see me on my birthday. So every Halloween, she comes and gives me another dollar at exactly she, noon. She does. Yes. And well, since that day that I first saw her, I've been see I've been seeing ghosts everywhere. In the streets, in houses, and in the house I'm living right now, it used to be a funeral home. Oh, that's bad. And on January 1st of every year, you there's a uh, funeral going on in the living room. All the furniture's gone. There's there's a funeral going on? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, room... Doesn't this uh, make you want to move? No, I've gotten used to it. 
Sure. Down to the living room, funeral going on. Get used to that. Well, it's only one day a year. <laughs> but it'd be one day too many for me. And then, then you're seeing ghosts everywhere anyway. You're beginning to see entities. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, it doesn't really scare me. They, don't, they can't harm me. How do you know that? Well, ghosts don't harm you. How do you know that? Because I've talked to them. Well, maybe the ones you know don't. But uh, we've heard some pretty strange stories this morning. Well, most of the ones that do hurt you are the demons. Demons? Yeah. Um, how does a person who doesn't see a lot of these entities like yourself discern yeah. the difference? Well, you can't really tell. Well, you've made my point for me. Uh, thank you very much for the call. <laughs> You can't really tell. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, good morning. Good morning to you. Uh, you know what? Let me tell you something real fast though, before I tell you my story, because I heard what you were saying about that clattering teeth, uh, uh, little skull thing you had. Yeah. Real quickly, uh, this reminds me of something I almost forgot about. A few years ago, I worked at a hotel at a graveyard shift in San Diego. Oh, yes. And uh, from my vantage point, right across is a, is a restaurant which we shared property with, and they were already closed, but there was one man left in there, and he was cleaning up. And uh, there is a phone link, uh, like you hit three numbers, and we could call each other back and forth should we need to during the day. Gotcha. Okay, well, anyway, he was in the back, and suddenly he came running out into the to the lobby. Well, just before he did, I mean just seconds before he did, the phone rang, and it was from the restaurant. I could tell by the switchboard it was a restaurant. And I thought he was calling me for something, so I looked over to see who it was. Nobody was there. And I thought, what is this? Well, he came over, and he had, this is around Christmas time, this must have been maybe three years ago, and he had one of those little heads like you're talking about, but a Santa Claus one that would say, ho, ho, ho. Yes. And you actually got to clap your hands to make some noise before it did that. that he said that yes. thing was doing that, and there was nobody clapping, you know, their hands or making any such noise. And when he came out the door, a side door, which was not within my uh, vantage point, you know, from behind. Right. At the same time as when that phone rang. And anyway, that was just a strange incident, you know. That was that was kind of. But I almost forgot about that one. But when you until I mentioned the skull, yeah, that I've I got thought, here. oh, I remember that. But let thing me is pretty you, cool. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. Well, this this occurred when I was very young. I must have been about five or six years old, and this carried on for a few years. I lived in a home in Pomona, California, and um, I don't have a full recollection of the layout of the home, but I remember my room I shared with my brother was a pretty good sized room at the end of a hallway. And at the, um, if you were to walk down the hallway toward where the living room would be, to the left was our kitchen. Now, my mother worked the graveyard shift that, um, during that time. She worked at a factory of some kind, and she had to leave right. real late at night. And I remember the first incident that ever occurred in that house um, was at, I knew all, okay, I lived kind of a strict family that the kids stayed in the room until they were allowed to get up in the morning for breakfast. Right. You know, we were real little, all of us, the three of us. My brother, and myself, and my sister, who had another room in a different part of the house. Well, I remember all the noises that I would hear. My mother making coffee, you know, stirring the cup and setting the cup down, and and then um, turning the lights off, and then going out the front door, closing it, locking it, jumping in her car, and leaving. The whole sequence of sounds was always the same because sure. I was pretty much awake during that. You time. get used to the rhythm of a house. The rhythm yeah. of the house, mm -hmm. exactly. Well, <clears throat> I do remember. The first incident that I can actually recall directly was hearing, after she was gone, and the house dark again, I heard the sound of the coffee cup clanking down on the uh, counter. Mm -hmm. Now, this happened, that was pretty much it at first, and I thought, now, what is this? You know, I started getting curious because I know that she left for work, you know. Well, one night, I heard the coffee cup go down, and I saw the light turn on after my mom had left. So I got up, and I went to see if my mom had come back somehow. Well, I go to the kitchen. And nobody is there. Now, uh, incidents started to increase like this, and I would tell my dad and I'd tell my mother, I would tell any adult that would listen to me, including parents of my friends, and they all thought I was dreaming, and, you know, they didn't believe me. They, they don't listen to kids enough, I don't think. I know. Well, um, incidents started to, to um, uh, and, uh, increase, and also something else started happening, too. My dogs would get out, and my, we had two short-haired dogs we'd let in at nighttime, and we had them in the back room, and we had the washing machine and dryer. And pretty much, quite free, you know, I wouldn't say every day, but I'd say at least once a week, the dogs would get out, and they'd come tearing up the hallway and jumping on our beds and stuff, and my dad would get myself and my brother in trouble for that, thinking that we're letting the dogs out. Never 
once did either my brother or I ever do that ever. But we're accused of it pretty much every day, you know, because it seemed as though that was happening. And I'm beginning to wonder about that now. But the incidents that I know were spiritual in nature started to improve, started to improve, started to increase. For example, when um, I would wake up suddenly with a start during the night. And uh, something would wake me up, and why or, or how sharply, I, I can't really explain. But there would be a very, very cold presence in the room, extremely, yeah. extremely cold, and it would be hovering right over my bed. Mm. And I know it was something, but I didn't know what it was. But it would come quite frequently, and it would seem as though it was draining energy for me because it would go from my feet up into my chest area. Succubus. And, 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 and then it would go away, and this would happen a lot of times. I would say fairly frequently. Well, at one point, um, when this would happen, I would first wake up. All right, we don't have much time left. Okay, I'm going to hurry this. I would get up and I would run for it into, like, what my grandmother's room was and jump into bed with her and hide from this thing. Well, um, this continued for the very, very longest time. Now, I, I know I don't have got much time, so I'm just going to get to the good part. There came a time when we were going to move from the house. And um, I remember telling this, this whatever, that uh, you'll never bother me again. You'll never, ever bother me again. We moved to a house in Ontario, California. With, within about a year or so, one, I was in about the fourth grade by this time. I remember this incident very specifically, looking up the hallway and seeing a very short man, what, very white, glowing like a powdery white color, walking up the, walking up the hallway. Hands in his pockets like wearing a navy pea coat, and his head was crouched down. He went right into my room. I ducked underneath the covers, but I could tell he was right outside. I uh, kind of peek out, and he's right there. He puts his hand on me, and I do not know how to describe this. Maybe some of your guests have experienced this before, too, or your other listeners. But it seemed as though he was reading my mind. Like, every thought I had, he was telling what I was thinking. And the only thing I could say, that was the weirdest experience and absolutely impossible to describe. But I do remember seeing the person's face. And it was blank. It was just a blank. A blank face. face. All right. Well, I appreciate the story. Uh, I would say this, that children and animals sense these things before adults do. Not that adults don't experience them, but they have to be much more obvious. And sometimes they can occur, and your animals will know there is a presence. Your children will know. And you will put it off, as one does children, uh, to their active little imaginations. Uh, when they get older and they become as you, they too will be basically immune to it. That doesn't mean it's not there. You just have forgotten how to see it and hear it and know it. But not children and not animals. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning, Art. Good morning. This is Grant in Seattle. Yes, Grant. Um, got the mood lighting, the candle, the open closet. And all that. <laughs> um, I wouldn't open the closet. <laughs> uh, got a story for you about sure. a haunted radio station I worked at about seven years ago in southern Idaho. Oh, there's plenty of stories in broadcasting. Southern Idaho, huh? Yes. All right. Um, I won't mention the station because the management would get quite upset. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> even if we would ask about the ghost. Um, I worked there on the weekends, overnight shift, and um, basically the only one in the station. Um, had heard about the ghost years before. We used to go out there for the ghost tour, and they would show us things that it would do. It would flip on lights, basically on command. Really? And um, so when I would work out there, lights would flip on and off. Phones would ring pick it up, be a dial tone, hang it up, ring, dial tone. Um, the layout of the station, the way it was set up, if you wanted a Coke or a snack, sure. you were in the basement. Right. Which at 3.30 in the morning, you're kind of freaked out and you're hungry, you go to the basement. <laughs> That's right. And so I would go down to the basement, and the layout of the station, say from the south wall there were death, going north, there would be the stairwell to the basement, Mm. On the other side of that would be the wall of automated machines and then just straight over to the, the opposite wall. Mm -hmm. I'd be downstairs hearing footsteps move from the desk across the stairway through the automation just in a straight line, just a big thud, 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 thud. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what do you do at that point? That's not good. <laughs> None of that is good. Do you stay down there and get the Coke or do you go back upstairs and face it? Uh, the strange thing about this ghost, it's, it was connected to one of the DJs that worked there. 
um, before it ever appeared at the station, it was at his house. And um, I guess it was a pretty... Things that happened to me at the station weren't violent. Things that happened previously to other DJs that were pretty violent. Things being thrown at them. Um, well, that can happen. Yeah. Uh, in other words... Uh, it can be transferred, usually because it occupies a person, and that person brings it to a new place. Yeah, that's what happened with this. His yeah. wife left his house with his kids, said it got it had gotten that bad, told him to have a priest come in there and bless the house or move mm -hmm. or whatever, but she wasn't coming back till something was done. Had a priest come in and bless the house. The minute they did that, stopped there, everything started up out at the radio station where he worked. Yeah, there you are. All right, well, see, it was forced out of one location, transferred itself. Interesting. Very interesting. Wildcard Line, you're on the air. Hi. Hello, P Art. Pat here, KSFO, San Francisco. Hello, Pat. Ah, uh, boy. I'm ready to run just like you. A lot of these stories, I'd yes. be gone just like you. Uh, that's right. Teenager, Golden Gate Park, um, a place called, well, maybe the kids called it Dark Valley. We used to mm -hmm. ride our bikes through there uh, in the evening. Of course, on the streets, it'd be much lighter, but down amongst the trees, there was a nice road we used to love to take. It dipped down, and then we'd pedal like hell to get to the other end. Um, I'd have to say Grim Reaper. Whether man in a costume or I have no idea. Pedaling down about 5 in the evening, mighty dark, oh, yes. and with a friend on our Schwinn's or our single speed bikes and it's dark near the tree line we're in a road about six feet wide sure enough the, the perfect example just out of the darkness walks black cape hood front of the face baggy hood can't see the face gleaming sickle, sickle. in other words in other words a normal San Francisco resident <laughs> no, exactly. just, just, just kidding uh, uh, I mean, even with a sickle and everything? The, I couldn't believe it, Art. I couldn't believe it. And, of course, he comes out of it just as we pass. And the, arms, the arm goes up. I'm screaming by now. Oh, my God. You're He's on screaming, a swim. my buddy, pedaling like hell. Yeah. And I go, like, right under his arm. The cape touches me. Oh, man. Okay, and we're out of there. Okay, the police... Um, a big friend of mine, let's go back and we'll get him, you know, it's some weirdo. Yeah. Well, Art, I had, I had, um, never had anybody die around me. But sure enough, within that week, my best friend, not the man, not the guy I was with on the bike. Yeah. But did he not die, um, on a motorcycle down out in front of the beach? Um, he was going too fast. We were taking turns on this motorcycle. Woman, um, from the middle lane, cut across right in front of him to maybe, get into the parking lot. Maybe that was the Grim Reaper. I'm telling you. And maybe you will see that again. I, in other words, there are people that see that figure before those close to them die. I'll tell you, Art. And those Ouija boards, stay away from them. I'll let you go. Thank you very Thank much you for, for the call. Uh, uh, take care. Uh, the Bay Area. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. This is Jenny in Golden. Golden, Colorado? That's right. All right. And uh, I've got a pretty interesting story for you. All right, let her rip. Okay. I live in a house that is probably 112 years old from a historic district in Golden. Yes, sir. And, well, I never detected anything really funny about the house except for one time. And I was, uh, actually, I was taking a bath. It was uh, late at night, and uh, I had a candle burning. Uh -huh. And uh, this wasn't so odd, but the candle just blew out, went out. But five minutes, I just, I just sat there because I was taking the bath, and I, I said, whatever, whatever, no big deal. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe five minutes later, it comes back on. Now, that's bad. Yeah. That's the, really bad. Five minutes later, it came back on. Right. Now, if it had been maybe a second, I could maybe see that, but it wasn't a trick candle. It was just a basic candle. Right. And the flame was dancing up and down really high, mm -hmm. and it just came back on. Mm -hmm. So what did you do? I was pretty terrified. I just kind of sat there. The water, of, get water got pretty cold. The water got cold? Well, because, you, because I was you sitting so long. In other words, you wouldn't get back out again? Right. I was pretty scared. The candle that wouldn't die. 
Pretty good one, huh? True? Yes, very true. Absolutely true. Absolutely positively you, you true. You swear on your bathwater it's true. I swear on the cold bathwater. Well, I don't know what I'd do in a case like that, but I'd probably do... I don't know if I'd sit there and, until the water got cold. I'd, I'd, uh, but then again, I might. Were you just sort of frozen with fear? That was basically it. I was basically just petrified. <laughs> All right, my friend. I appreciate the call. All right, thanks. Thank you. As we continue to listen to the strange, the unusual ghost stories, it is Halloween. The only thing about these are that uh, they are real, and that's why they scare you. And another good question might be, why do you think you like to be scared? Hmm? How much do you like to be scared? If you haven't done it yet, why don't you do it? Go turn, turn down the light, turn out the light. If you've got the guts, we've got another hour. Stay right there. Listening to the best of Art Bell. From the Kingdom of Nye, Coast to Coast AM continues with Art Bell. On the first time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, how are you? Fine. Where are you, sir? Uh, I'm fine. Where am I? Yes. Uh, I'm calling from Ojai, California. Ojai. I know it well, all right? Well, very well. Back in 1981, I was 19 years old in Arkansas. Yes, sir. Okay, and uh, I was with an acquaintance that night. And um, he was into the occult. Okay. Now, I was not. We uh, said goodnight. I went home, and it was uh, just getting dark, and I went to bed. Okay, I'm facing the wall, and then um, starting to doze off, and not quite asleep, I get an eerie feeling, and the room gets chilly. I turn over to my other side. There's the the man that I was with early on that evening. Bad sign. And I looked at him and I said, what are you doing here? I said, how would you get in? Because I had the the door dead bolted and chained. Mm-hmm. And uh, he just looked at me and he just, he just laughed. He said, ha, 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 John. And that was all that he said. And so then I got up. I was awake. I got up and I followed him. And um, he led me into the kitchen. Mm-hmm. I flipped on the switch, the light went on, he disappeared. So I went to the door, <laughs> and it was dead bolted and still chained. So, um, actually, I wasn't scared that night when it happened. However, every night there on out, I went to sleep with the light on for quite a while. I'm sure you did. Yes, sir, I did. And I asked him about it the next day, and he just chuckled. So, um, uh-huh. not quite a ghost story because he was still alive, but, um, I did see him there, and he disappeared. That, that, that's horrible, sir. And it, I wouldn't like that one bit, uh, whether he was alive or not. That would mean he had projected himself into your house. Right, but I believe in, in the spiritual world, but I believe in, well, I, I don't believe it was actually his spirit. I believe in demons, and I believe it was probably something that he did that caused that to happen for sure, but I don't yeah, actually believe that was I'm, I'm sure so. I mean, if he laughed, it was obvious he knew, so he had projected himself into that house. In a physical form. That uh, that takes a lot of power. I've got to run. Thank you. Okay, good night. Good night. Listen to this one, folks. Dear Art, in 1975, I was stationed on the old USS Roosevelt aircraft carrier. We were on a med cruise in port in Sicily. While on leave, I went to the USO to call home. And my mother answered the phone and began crying as soon as she realized it was me. She told me, do not go back to the ship when it goes back to sea again. 
She was almost hysterical about it. She made me promise that I would not go no matter what might be done to me, even if it meant a court-martial. I was the supply officer's yeoman. So I made arrangements to fly to Naples, Italy, which was to be our next stop in seven days. My job would be to set up water and garbage barges for the carrier when it arrived. My berthing area on the ship was all the way forward, just below the cat launchers. While the USS Roosevelt was going through the Messina Straits between Italy and Sicily, she collided with a Liberian wheat freighter. We hit it broadside. My berthing area collapsed the sleeping area, which had been pushed into it. The collision occurred about 2 a.m., and I would have been asleep at that time, and I would have very likely been killed. When the ship arrived in Naples, I couldn't believe what had happened. Mothers do know what's best, and it's signed simply Jerry. Wild card line, you're on the air. All right, this is Forrest, calling from Denver. Hello, Forrest. How are you? Fine. Um, this is another Colorado law enforcement ghost story. Did you, uh, you, you heard the one I read? Oh, yeah. Oof. Yeah. Yeah, this one is, um, uh, the officer will remain anonymous as well as the agency, if that's okay. That's fine. Um, a couple of years ago, a veteran officer in Colorado was on a routine night patrol on a kind of a misty night. And he was driving along a road he knew very well, hadn't been in that area for many years. He saw a gentleman walking or standing alongside the road. Well, it was a little bit unusual because it was in a rather desolate area mm -hmm. of Colorado. He pulled over, sure. did a routine uh, field interrogation right. on the fellow. He turned out to have no ID, uh, gave him a name, whatever the name was. It didn't matter. And he had no reason to hold him, uh, not, you know, not having any weapons on him or anything like that. So he just let him go. Sure. Yeah, you know, He didn't necessarily search him, but he had no reason to hold him or act any further. Understood. So... About 20 or 30 miles down the road, as he was driving along, he spots another fellow standing alongside the road. Mm -hmm. uh, this guy knew the area real well. He did not turn back on himself or get lost. He pulls over. Here we go again. The guy comes over to the car. The officer rolls down the opposite window. The guy looks inside the uh, patrolman's car, and he realizes it's the same guy. <laughs> uh, he looks at him. Uh-huh. You know, it's kind of taken aback, decides, hey, what's up with this? Gets out of his car, turns the lights on, you know, walks around the car, to, to, proceeds to want to interrogate this fellow further, and he's just gone. Gone. He's just not there. True story? Yes. I have it on very good authority. Yes. I appreciate your telling it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay. that, that is uh, but one of many in law enforcement. And as you know, they work in all hours. Law enforcement goes on 24 hours a day. And so they're out there in the dark hours. And uh, things happen. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. Hello. Uh, this is Bill from Savage, Minnesota. Hi, Bill. KSTP. You bet. Uh, I had an experience about five years ago. I went to a housewarming party from... Uh, Acquaintance at work, and uh, during the party, I went into the restroom, and I was standing there, and just this cold shiver came over me, and then a voice in my head, wasn't my voice, is screaming, get out. Really? Uh, I would take that uh, at face value myself. I left. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Uh, and also, another friend of mine who grew up in the area, and some other kids uh, that I hunt with every year. Uh, about 20 years prior to that, one of the guys that I hunted with, uh, his mother committed suicide in that house uh -huh. with a gun in the bathroom. Yes. Yeah, I don't know what it is about that kind of death, but uh, everybody out there who's ever contemplating such a thing should bear in mind these sorts of stories. Uh, these spirits seem to be caught or linger or don't know to go on. I don't know what occurs to them. Yeah, it was, it was the strangest thing because I questioned another friend. I've never told this guy about it. 
but I questioned another friend who grew up in the area, and he told me all about it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, I never believed in that kind of stuff either, but uh, I firmly believe these days. Sure. I appreciate the call, sir. I love your show. Thank you. Um, Art, in 1971, I was working for a company that managed apartment units in San Jose, California. My job was to repair and maintain them. There was one apartment building in East San Jose where tenants were constantly complaining about one of the units on the second floor. All the people who lived on that floor said that people were constantly coming and going from the apartment in question uh, at all hours of the night. They also said there were people chanting and screaming came from the unit late at night. The police had responded to the address many times, but no charges were ever proven. At last, my company succeeded in evicting the tenants, and a work order was issued to prepare the apartment for new tenants. So, the next morning, I responded to the unit to inspect, repair, issue cleaning orders, or whatever was needed to rent the unit. As I was trying to open the door, a kind old black lady from down the hall came over and said to me, Son, don't go into that apartment before you bring a priest to bless it. That place is evil. As I opened the door, I beheld an eerie sight. The walls were painted black. The windows covered with thick, dark cloth. All the light bulbs were placed with red-tinted bulbs. In the center of the living room, the carpet had been ripped out, and a pentagram painted inside a circle about eight feet in diameter was in the center of the room. In other rooms, there were altars of some kind, and the remains of small animals that had been tortured and killed recently. After the police had been called, made their reports and left, I rented a dumpster and cleaned the place out. As I was hauling all this carnage out of the building, a man approached me and told me not to defile a sacred place, or I would be in great danger. Not being a believer, I told him, unless he disappeared real quick, he'd be the one in great danger. After a long and disgusting day, I went home, not wanting to upset my wife, told her nothing of the events of that day. The evening, a normal one, later that night we went to bed. At about 2 a.m., I was awakened by my dog going crazy and my wife screaming at the top of her lungs. As I sat up in bed, I felt the room was freezing cold. There were two pillars of blue light that went from the floor at the foot of our bed to the ceiling. The pillars were pulsating blue light and shimmering in the dark. My wife began to pray. I screamed. Several minutes later, the lights faded away. The next day, I contracted the rest of the job and never responded to that address again. And I'll withhold the name. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Yeah, what's that, Art? Hi. Hey, I'm Jose from El Cajon, California. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, KFMB, right? Yeah, San Diego. Uh-huh. And my story has to do with your radio show. My radio show? Yeah. Um, a couple of days ago, you had a guest on about Poltergeist. Yes, I did. Brad Steiger. Yeah, and um, I was listening to your show, and all of a sudden, my radio turned all the way up. Oh. And I couldn't turn it down at all. I tried everything. I turned it off. It wouldn't. Somebody happen. wanted you to hear something. Nobody. I don't know what happened. It just wouldn't. It wouldn't shut off or anything. Just really weird. <laughs> I tried to turn it down. It just wouldn't turn down. I turned. I turned it off. It finally went off a couple of seconds after I turned it off. My radio usually turns off right after I turn it off, though. Well, there's always been something about this program. Yeah, I just thought it was really weird about Poultry Guys, and all of a sudden my radio just turned all the way up by itself. How's it been behaving since? Perfectly fine. Um, works normal. I'm using it right now, so... Doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Take it for what it's worth. Thank you very much for the call. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Hello? Hello? Yes, hi. Hi, Art. This is Marcy calling from Juneau, Alaska. Well, Juneau, Alaska. Uh, hi, Marcy. How are you? I'm doing fine. My husband and I have just started watching your show, and we enjoy it a great deal. 
Do you actually sit there and stare at the radio? <laughs> well, actually, uh, it's on TV. <laughs> we have our uh, scanner channel on. Oh, I see. All right. Um, and I have a story um, that has a very good moral behind it, not to play with a Ouija board. Uh. Um, my very best friend um, used to babysit in a house, and um, she babysat for years there. The house was always, you know, a warm, happy home. Mm-hmm. And a new family moved into the home, and um, she was recommended to the family um, as a babysitter. And she began babysitting for this new family, and the house began to change. It became a very gloomy house. Uh, you know, things, very odd things would go on. The dog would go crazy at, you know, any time. You think it was because of her? Um, well, I can, I'll tell you what we, I think it was after All right. the beginning portion. Um, there was a two-year-old little girl, and she would go into these trances. She wouldn't, uh, I mean, you could stand in front of her and scream, and she wouldn't come out of it, and it would last for quite a while. Oh, that's weird. And and I have a two-year-old myself, and I know that's, like, impossible. <laughs> but um, she would go through these weird things that were going on. Um, the, she wouldn't, the kids would never wake up at night, a five-year-old and two-year-old, which I think is very odd myself because I yes. have children. Yes. Um, and several things would happen, and this, you know, grew more and more, and she grew more and more uneasy about babysitting there. And one night... Um, she decided to give the children a bath because they really needed a bath. You know, the mother had changed, the kids had changed, the house had changed, everything was kind of yuck. And so she gave the kids a bath, um, and she washed the little boy in the tub, and the little girl who was two years old was petrified of being washed. And she was washed in the sink because she could sit in there and it was easier for her to handle the little girl. Okay, we've got to hurry. Okay. And um, eventually, they, she put them to bed. They never woke up. She was sitting, talking on the phone with her boyfriend, and all of a sudden, the water in the bathroom, in the tub, in the sink, just shot on full force, and there was no one in there. And so finally, she got the courage to go peek at the bathroom, and the water turned off. You mean right before her eyes? Right. Hmm. And um, later on, she found out that the woman had um, had a priest come in. She, she never babysat for them again. She told them she's never going to babysit again. Um, a priest had come into the house and blessed the house, um, tried to rid it of the evil spirit, um, and there was a Ouija board involved. The woman threw it out the door. Um, but eventually the house became abandoned, and no one had lived in it for, I would say, about 10 years. Story of the babysitter. All right, thank you, dear. From Juneau, Alaska. That's the capital, by the way, of Alaska. You can only get to it by air or water. Did you know that about Juneau and Alaska? I'm Art Bell, and this is CBC. Hey, Art, two cousins of mine who are brothers slept in the basement of an old house about 25 years ago. Both were teenagers. The younger was very angry with his father, who was divorced from his wife. One night, the boys drew a pentagram on the basement floor, surrounded by candles, and tried to raise a spirit to perform some evil act against their father. Well, after a while, with nothing having happened, the boys went to bed. In the basement, there was an anvil that was so heavy the boys together couldn't even budge it an inch. Early in the morning, the boys were awakened by the sound of that anvil scraping across the basement floor. They turned on the lights, and indeed the anvil had moved several feet. Needless to say, they were frightened out of their wits. The elder of the boys never again would go anywhere near the basement. That's from Dennis in Kansas City. On our first time caller line, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Art. This is Brad calling from San Diego. Hi, Brad. Hi. Um, you know, I was going to call with this story last year, and I, I get so frightened just thinking about it, I, I chickened out, so I'm going to give it a try this year. All right. Give it, give it your best shot. Um, it was in Hawaii about uh, two years ago. 
Uh, my wife was asleep, and um, I was out um, watching one of the shows they have at Waikiki every night. And there were two enormous Hawaiian men that just sang like uh, birds. And he was married to this beautiful young woman who would dance. And as I watched this woman during the evening, there was something about this woman that just completely bothered me, just unnerved me, something unnatural about the way she danced. And as I watched her, um, at one point I had a, a distinct feeling that I, I was watching a snake dance. It, it was just for a second, just kind of like an overshadowing to something. I understand. And, and we had this eye contact, and she looked at me like, like, oh, the secret's out. And I was completely unnerved, and I walked back to the room and fell asleep. Uh-huh. And was only asleep for maybe a couple minutes when my wife let out the most blood-curdling scream, jumped out of bed, ran to the door, was clawing at the door, trying to get out of the room. And oh, wait, 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 wait. What was clawing at the door? Yeah, my wife was. She, she, she jumped, she woke up um, screaming jumped out of bed, ran to the door of our uh, hotel room, and was clawing at the door on her knees, trying to get out of the room, just just screaming, trying to get out of this room. And I I brought her up, and she said uh, she came to, and there was a, there was something standing over the bed looking down at her, and this, it was just a couple of moments later. And I, I did my best to calm her down, and she, she went back to sleep almost immediately, like almost like if you were talking to someone who had been walking in their sleep. And in the morning we spoke, and I had the distinct uh, feeling that I had seen this lady dancing. That it's her, her familiar or whatever it was she used to, to do her act mm-hmm. had seen me and followed me back to the room. And the second I'd fallen asleep, this thing had hovered over my wife and woken her up and, and, and just... That is uh, truly frightening. It scares me to death to stay in it. Oh, well, thank you for bringing it to us. This was the right night. Thank but, you. Thank you, Art. Bye. Take care. Familiar. Do you know what a familiar is? Maybe you don't want to. This is CBC. Wildcard Line, you're on the air. Good morning. Hi, Art. This is TJ from Colorado Springs. Yes, sir. Uh, we. It's a long story. I was into all the paranormal stuff. I had a friend who said he was a wizard, which intrigued me and uh, went through the stuff. We ended up going to Genesee Park at the uh, summer solstice mm-hmm. to see tree spirits. We got up to this one point in Genesee Park, and we were sitting there doing our little thing to see this, and the air felt heavy. Everything just started feeling bad. We started seeing little red eyes peering red at eye, us. Red and, eyes. Yeah, and they kept coming and stuff. So we decided to get out of there. Good move. We started going back to our car, and on the way back to the car, I looked off to my left, and there was, well, no, it was my right, there was a meadow, and something caught my eye, and I was just, like, fixed on the spot. What I saw was, like, gray figures out of the corner of my eye making a circle and and moving, like, counterclockwise around a glowing, like a fire or something. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I didn't think anything of it until all of a sudden my friend stopped and turned and looked where I was looking and said, look at that, they're dancing. (laughs) And at this point, everybody in the group freaked. We started running. (laughs) And as we started to run, there were other gray figures coming from both sides of the road following us like, like scouts and stuff. Mm-hmm. It, it, just coming at us, and I was freaking at this point. I was into a lot of things. I had a dragon necklace on that had been a protection spell put on it by Wiccans, you know, witches and stuff. Yes, yes. And at this point, I grabbed, you know, my necklace, and I was just like, dragons, please help us. At this point, a bright light shined in our face, and we all... It, it, All of a sudden, all the heaviness and everything dropped. We all stopped. Turned out to be a golden police officer who detained us. Some of us had warrants out for parking tickets and whatnot. We all gave the IDs. Everything went okay. Uh, We left. There's only one road going in and out, and we watched for him coming back, and he never came back. And we were all freaked out, but the next day we got our courage up and went back up <laughs> in two separate groups without 
without Let's talking see. to each other, yeah. uh, we went up. I got about halfway up the mountain into the park. I saw my friend's car, which had just been redone and everything, just dead as a doornail. We finally got that started up and got to the top of the mountain where all this had started. We went up to the spot where we had been sitting at that point, and there were thousands of ladybugs crawling all over the spot where we had all been sitting. You guys are out of your minds. And, and well, we were at that point. At least I was at that point. I was into, you know, everything. The Ouija, you know, everything. And come to find out, you know, talking to other people and everything, that uh, that's a common occurrence when something paranormal or spiritual happens, that especially ladybugs, which are the symbol of, like, good luck, tend to... I don't know, congregate mm. at a spot where something bad might have happened. Yes. But it comes to find out not only is Genesee Park built over an Indian burial ground, <laughs> but that's Jefferson County Police Patrol. That's way out of the jurisdiction of Golden Police Department. They shouldn't have been there. They shouldn't have been there, and the people that were with us that had warrants out for their arrest for not appearing in court. You know, nothing major, mm -hmm. but they skipped court. Nothing ever happened to that. But I'll tell you, to this day, I have not been back up there. I don't blame you. Uh, finally, you made a right choice. God, that's a weird story. Whew. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. Steve from South Dakota. Hello, Steve. I have a story that I haven't told too often, uh, and I'm trying to recall it here as I listen to your show, but it yeah, you know, it happened to me when I was about eight years old. What was it? I lived in Fort Madison, Iowa, down on the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. And our family lived in a two, uh, you know, two-story farmhouse. Uh, it was a two-story brick house on on a hill. And I used to sleep on the south side of the house. And I faced a pasture where I used to play cowboys and Indians when I was a boy. And above the pasture valley, there was a highway that curved about a half a mile around to the east of the house. Mm -hmm. Uh you know, there was one night that I couldn't sleep, and, and I just looked out the window, and I saw the, you know, you know, I saw these lights of a car coming around the highway. They came off the highway toward mm -hmm. my window and disappeared into the valley where we always played. Well, I was petrified. This is a true story. I was absolutely petrified. I, I remember going in and, you know, screaming to my mom and dad about it. And this happened two nights in a row. I can vividly remember this whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, a few days later, some friends of mine and I were playing down in the you know, pasture. Yes. And toward the east, a light appeared. It was the same hue, the same size. And across this road, there was a grass airfield, and it was an airplane that had taken off. And the plane, we watched this plane, the front wheels, it was a Piper Cub, Hit the phone wires and crash nose into the highway, Oof. and we, and we watched it crash and it and it crashed. It was heading right for the place where these lights were that I had seen before. Wow! So it was a real crash. Yes, it was. Ooh, that is freaky. But it was the same size of light and 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 the same color of light, and it was sort of like almost that I had some kind of a you know you know. Uh, you know, premonition or something. I, under I understand, and I, I can thank you. I can understand there would be a premonition about that sort of event. That that sort of event, a plane crash, a car crash, a death, would notch itself deeply into a whatever space and time exists for such things. They are traumatic events. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi, Art. Yes. Janice and to call my out delivering paper, so it's not the best night to be listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Janice. But um, when we, when I was first married, my husband and I lived in Redlands, California. He flew um, C-141s down there at Norton Air Force Base, and so nice. I was home alone a lot. And <clears throat> we had purchased a brand new home, and it was a real peaceful home. But I went through a period of time where. Um, Things were going on that just I kind of ignored, but um, there were kind of sounds at night and things. And one night I remember the garage door, there was a, the, the doorknob was moving, 
and my dog started barking absolutely crazy. So I called the police, and they came out and looked around, nothing. And then slowly there's just an ominous kind of feeling began to come through the home when I would be alone at night. And I was always glad when my husband would come home from his trips because I would feel a little bit more secure. But this one night, the, this coldness that would come into the house became more and more um, obvious. And I really, as I look back on it, I become more aware of it than I was at that point. But I felt an uneasiness in the home. One night I was laying in bed and we had a full-length mirror on a dresser at the foot of the bed. And I was sound asleep. And all of a sudden I was just like a shock. I was woken. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Some people are just like oh, just yes. brought out of sleep, like oh, in a no, cold I, sweat. I know exactly what you're talking and about. And I looked at the foot of my bed, and there was a black figure standing there. In front of the mirror, there was no reflection in the mirror. <laughs> and, I mean, I laid there paralyzed. Of course. And I just began to pray the Lord's Prayer. I couldn't, you know, I nothing else. And I had known, as a Christian, I had known that we had authority over anything, but... That thing was gone, and, I, and after that, the whole house warmed up again. But it was the bizarrest experience that I have ever, I have no idea why, what, what, you know, what triggered it, and, but it was so real, and for a while I thought I imagined it, and I didn't share it with anybody, but, you know, as I've, over the years, heard more people account of the same type of, of experiences that something had manifested itself at the foot of my bed that had been there. Yep, it's easy to laugh at unless it's happened to you. Yeah, and it's it just, you know, and my husband, I was laying there, my husband was sleeping through this whole thing. And um, so I just wanted to relate that to you from my ghost story. Well, there you are. Thank you, and uh, have a good time delivering papers. Keep your head down. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi, Art. Hello. Funnest night of the year on your show. I love it. <laughs> Uh, well, it Jeff depends on your from... definition of fun. I mean... Well... Anyway, go ahead, sir. Uh, real interesting. Uh, this is Jeff Collin, uh, listening on Como. Right. Seattle area. I had an experience uh, at the uh, Custer Battlefield about five years ago. Went out there with my family, and I'd gone ahead to uh, the battle site by myself, and I was mm -hmm. up there in the afternoon, and turned out I was the last person in the park, and the ranger came up, and... Uh, said he'd go ahead and leave the gate unlocked and I could let myself out. I right. couldn't believe it. So I'm up there right by the mass grave site and uh, decided to take a walk along this path they have over to where some other guys were slaughtered. I was walking along there and it's real quiet. And the only thing you could hear was the wind in your ears. And I'm walking along and uh, I heard a very definite, it was a gravel path. I heard a footstep right behind me and I turned around and mm. I thought the ranger was back. Right to uh, tell me I had to leave now. Sure. It was almost dark. I turned around, and there was no one there, and my heart just leaped into my throat. I thought, what the heck? Mm -hmm. well, I must have been imagining things. So I turned around started to walk again, and very definitely, and I was listening this time, I heard it again, Crunching. right behind me. Crunching. Walking? Right, like a footstep on the gravel. Yeah. And I stopped, and this, it took one more step and stopped. And I thought, my God, I turned around, and I said, you know what? So I decided, well, said out loud, you know, hey, you know, if you're there, what is it? What do you want? And I never got any kind of an answer, but uh, just could feel a very definite... Uh, presence? Presence, yeah. There was something with you. There must be something about sites of real tragedy, and, you know, violent death. There's no question about it. Yeah. Uh, battlefields. Uh, earlier we talked about the island of Okinawa. Right. It's, uh, it's a haunted island, sir. I can yeah. tell you, uh, places where many, many people have died uh, violently, unexpectedly, yeah. they're, they're haunted. That's all there is to it. It was astounding. Thank you. Take care. There's no doubt about it. Violent death, unexpected death, suicides, murders. They definitely... Uh, have, they have things that remain. Wildcard Line, you're on the air. Good morning. Hi, Art. This is Mike and uh, KEX. Hi, uh, Mike. This is a story about demons. Demons. Lucifer. Yes. And angels. All right. And it's a true story. Well, we don't have a lot of time, I so understand. lay it out. About a year prior to my sister's death in 1980, my younger sister, she had a couple strokes at my parents' house. And she was incoherent for about a month, 
he would just babble, and she would just stare straight forward. Mm-hmm. And after she came out of that, we asked her, do you remember anything about the time that you were in that state? And she said, uh, I remember a, a half man, half goat uh, type demon, and it came at me up in the room. She stayed in my parents' room during this time. Half man, half goat? Right. She said, why are you here? And he said, that does not matter. What matters is that I stay here until the job is done. And she kept asking it to to leave. And finally, it pinned her up against the back wall. And she rebuked it and it left. And that's the only thing she remembered. And during that time, we had a we had the family up there when all this was going on. And for, you know, because we were afraid she was going to die. In fact, she did one night. But uh, my granddad, during a family prayer, now, he's not a religious man, but he claims that he's seen an angel with his wings out spread over her. And this happened to him twice on two occasions. Now, on the third occasion, she was in a doctor's office, and he's seen a gray angel. And he says, well, this time he started to talk to it. He says, have you come to get her? And it said, no, I will tarry Yale yet a while longer. Hmm. But my dad, during the time that she was going through all this turmoil in her life at the helm, he went up in the orchard one night to pray, and uh, he claims that Lucifer appeared unto him, and he described him as being a a tall man, about 6'2", and long, straight, black hair, and he said his eyes were black and looked like bottomless pits, and what he said to him is he said, we'll just see how much you trust in your God once she has been gone. And uh, then at the family burial, when she finally died, yes, my granddad fell to his knees, and we thought he just passed out or something. I called him about three days later, and he says, I can't even get out of bed. He says, something happened up there, and he says, I was taken to another place. He says, I was in the midst of the most beautiful garden I've ever seen. And Marcy was standing on the side of a hill in a vineyard. And she turned and looked at me and said, Grandpa, everything is so perfect. And this was also seen at the identical time by a man in California who told me the exact same vision on that same time. Well, I'm not sure how many people could look the devil, you know, Lucifer, in the eye and live through it. Well, it's, uh, he said it chilled him to the bone when he, when he talked to him like that. But, uh, I'm sure it would look... The program is over, and you get the Halloween honors. Good night, cruel world. (laughs) Good night, cruel world. I think there was a song by that title, wasn't there? Well, that's a wrap on Ghost to Ghost for this year. I'm going to take a couple of days off, and you're going to get to hear a couple of great repeats. Good night, America. Good night, Canada. Good night, all.